All right, well, welcome. Thanks for yes. coming to our um, clinic uh, seminar on pain and lifting. Um, we have been coaching for several years now and having dealt with athletes who and ourselves who've had pain during lifting, we have put together quite a lot of tools that we would love to share with people. And we figured now's a great time to put all of the things together so that we can share them with y'all. Um, so yeah. And first of all, though, this is, we must say this. <laughs> we do have to cover our asses and yours, honestly. Like, we are not yeah. medical professionals. We are not pretending to be. None of the advice or anything that appears like advice is actually not. Okay, so if you are experiencing any acute pain, you really do need to go see someone. This is not just to cover our asses. Like, we don't want you getting hurt or injuring yourself further. Um, so, yeah, it's yeah, all it's all about programming and, like, how to reframe it in your mind. None of this is intended as medical advice. And our goal in this, is, our goal for ourselves is to lift our whole lives. Mm -hmm. Like we want to keep doing this. We want to be the 95 year old that's mowing their lawn, yes. you know, on the weekends and everybody's like, man, they're still going. It's like, yeah. well, yeah, this is why we're doing this. Um, so that's our goal with you guys is to make sure that you can do this for a long time. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> the things that we're going to talk about, it's not really a, it's, this is not about rehabbing. This is not about fixing like what's wrong with you. This is all about how do you achieve goals when you're experiencing pain or if you're going through something that's um, that requires you to alter your original plan perhaps mm -hmm. so that's that's our goal here yeah and we do understand and we also want to be the strongest lifters possible so we want to do this forever but we want we, we also do want to be very strong so it's kind of a middle ground of like how can you be as strong as possible while also trying to not get injured as much as you can or um, have resetting your goals, reframing your mindset around your goals when you are hurting. I'm going to switch spots with you because yeah, the camera okay. picks you up better if you're here. Okay. This is your part. All right. So first, um, and once again, not at all medical advice, but maybe assessing for yourself, are you actually injured? And what does it mean to be injured? Um, downstream effects of injury, like um, how does it, what does it do to your body and your mind? Um, specifically, making sure that you Pay attention to your goals and what they are. Um, paying attention to your mindset around what it means to be injured or what it means to be hurting. Um, that's probably the biggest part of all of this and why we try to make it systematic. That way, that kind of takes care of your mindset. If you have a system and you have a procedure in place that sort of takes care of the, well, what ifs and like all the scary parts of it, you just have to have a plan around it. And then, of course, our coaching secrets are our prevention strategies, basically, which are super important and very helpful. Um, and we have a lot of those. Um, so first, injury defined as any physiological damage to living tissue. So that's like something is actually damaged, like torn muscle, torn cartilage, ligament, something like that. There's actual damage to the tissue. Um, that matters because when we're framing an injury, when we're framing pain, pain does not necessarily does not necessitate an injury, okay? So you can be experiencing pain, referencing something that's not an actual damage to tissue. Um, that's important in, uh, reha in like taking care of that injury and programming around it is to understand that you may not actually be injured. There may be pain referencing and you just haven't let it calm down so that it will stop referencing. So pain does not necessarily mean injury. Um, and keeping your mind open to the possibility of Say you have something acute happen, you have an acute pain during lifting, keeping yourself open to the possibility of I'm not injured is super important in the rehabilitation process should you even be slightly injured or you have a tweak or something like that. Keeping your mindset open to I might be injured but I might not be. Kind of just, you know, letting it flow with curiosity instead of getting very like hard line about it um, is super key. Um, so what do we feel when we do have an injury? Of course, probably who here has been injured or hurt during lifting? Everybody. Yeah, we all have. Yeah, basically anybody who's pushing your body to any sort of extreme, um, which you're doing this, you're, so you are doing these things, you're going to experience pain um, during lifting. Maybe even an injury, maybe not an injury, maybe just pain. And you might feel frustrated. You might feel angry that this is happening to you. And you might feel like a little indignation. Like, what did I do to deserve this? Like, I'm trying to do all the right things. I'm doing what my coach said. Or I'm doing, you know, like, this other person is doing this. Like, why can't I do this without pain? Um, you might even feel a sense of resignation. Like, well, maybe this is just not for me. Like, maybe I just can't, like, hang with this. You know, like, I uh, can't deal with the pain or the injury. 
Or you might have a like, uh, try to outthink the injury. Well, I looked it up on Google and Google says that after two weeks, the knee pain should be gone. So I should be able to go in and squat now. Like I should be totally fine. Um, we have a lot of athletes that try that. Um, usually that is not the best way to handle things. Um, so if there is something wrong with your body, you do in fact have to let it heal. Bodies will heal themselves. Um, you just kind of have to give it time. And usually it involves not being completely away from lifting. Um, so these are some of the behaviors that we might see if someone has been injured or is having pain. Um, they might just SBD anyway. They might go in, load up on the ibuprofen and just decide to lift the way that they were lifting before, um, which is <laughs> worth it, like putting in there right now. We do not recommend taking any anti-inflammatory or any pain reliever while you're lifting. It blocks pain signals that would be really important to experience in case you were to actually cause tissue damage. So you need to know that, like you need to be aware if you're causing tissue damage. So we don't recommend taking ibuprofen or any sort of pain blockers while you're lifting. Um, maybe you test out a movement too soon. Um, so like the fuck around and find out model, like you're experiencing knee pain, but you're like, eh, it's been a couple weeks, it's feeling a little bit better. I'm just gonna like load up a few reds on there and just like see how it feels. Um, probably not the best idea either. Um, yeah, once again, you probably haven't rested it properly to let it get better. Or then you have the complete opposite of those ones. It's like someone who just like gives up. They rest entirely. They don't even want to walk around because they're having like discomfort somewhere. Like walking causes dis mild discomfort and they think that's not okay. So like anything that causes discomfort is not okay. So they'll just, you know, tend to stop everything. And what that does is that, um, prolongs the recovery process because of the damage you need to be walking and or doing things. Um, basically, it, and it can also lead to new pain. So if you've ever quit for any extended period of time, you may notice that new aches and pains that you did not have while you were lifting are showing up because inactivity causes pains as you get older. Um, yeah, it's just not the same as like, you know, when you're 20 and you wake up and everything's fine, like the older that we get, the more like just life pains, just like waking, out of waking up out of bed and your neck hurts, you know, like these things are going to happen. Um, but it is exacerbated if you stop doing your regular movement that you've been doing. Um, so yeah, basically, unless you're directed by a medical professional to cease all activity for some reason, like maybe you do have a surgery and you literally can't, mm -hmm. and then of course you shouldn't, right? But why is resting or doing nothing bad for aches and pains? It has been, uh, we have two sources here. There's more sources out there available. But full ROM movements, full range of motion movements, and regular activity have been shown to improve outcomes and the rehab process. So basically, and I think even recently, a study came out that um, lifting during the rehabilitation process, this was specifically for back pain or back injury, lifting during the recovery process was shown to like greatly improve outcomes. So in other words, you should be lifting during your um, rehabilitation process. Um, so like basically, unless everything is broken, you shouldn't stop what you're doing. You should just alter and modify around what you're doing. Let's say your low back is hurting or something like that. Well, what's to keep you from improving the front side of your body or the upper body or work on your bench press or like if leg drive hurts, do feet up bench. We have a lot of tools that we can pass out to people to help you um, through that process. And if I can just add yeah. <clears throat> something. So um, I think most of what we're talking about here is if you think of like a distribution curve of occurrences and severity of, of pain in lifting, we're talking about most of the center part of that that bell curve, right? But there's other cases like, you know, you had major knee surgery like two or three times. You're over on one side of that bell curve. Yes. You're not in the center, you're not, it's, that's not the same case. And I think Errol, yours is similar, where it sounds like you're having a lot of pain outside of lifting just in reg everyday life. Mm -hmm. That's not the center part of the bell curve. That's more of a special case where your decision tree is going to be different <coughs> than mm -hmm. somebody that woke up with knee pain one day and it's like, well, you know, my knee hurts. It's like a four or five out of 10. I'm not really sure what to do. Like that's a, that's a whole other thing. So just yeah. wanted to clarify. Yes, we are talking about the center of the bell curve here. But we have, yeah, we have, we have handled a little yes. bit of <laughs> yes. uh, information on the outer parts of the bell curve too. But for the most part, this first part of the presentation is about that center part. Yes, that's right. Um, so something, did I go over the last one? No, I did not. All right. So 
why doing nothing is completely is not good for it also is because from a mindset standpoint right like you're used to going in and you have this routine of lifting and suddenly you're completely derailed and you can't do your normal things quitting entirely takes away that big central part of your life something that's really important to you and it basically steals it away not to mention all of the like good feel good hormones that you get from this that elevate levels of you know dopamine and or other things other neuromodulators like that these things are important for your mental well-being and as well so it's not just that you're going to stagnate and feel new aches and pains in new places like mentally your whatever whatever your reasons behind doing this were are going to you know, you're basically just cutting them off. Um, it also kind of messes with you when you go back to train again, because then you have in your mind, well, I've missed all of this training. Now I'm feeling okay again. I'm just gonna like ramp it up a little bit faster so I can get back to where I was. And that increases the like, that is the most, um, that's the reason why 90% of people who go back to it get re-injured again is because you go back too hard too fast because you feel 100% fine so you're like okay well I don't really need to take my time like rehabbing this so I'm just going to go in I'll do one red then I'll do two reds and I'll do three reds and in a week I'll be back to where I was or maybe a month oh, gas, no still, <laughs> yeah exactly which is completely understandable because we've all we've all been through this and this is important to us and you don't want to miss out on this opportunity to be as strong as you can right now right nobody wants to feel that way you're getting excited. Um, you're ready to lift exactly again. you feel good you want to lift again um, making sure that you balance your approach and really just as you were saying it takes longer than you want it to take and it does even for minor injuries it takes longer than you want it to take but it's look at it in a more long term like do you want to burn out okay go ahead throw those reds on if you want it to be a longer term lifter you have to go slow with the process um, so yeah go back to why you started lifting in the first place think about like really delve into why do I want to lift why did I want to lift <laughs> Um, maybe it's because you like working hard. Maybe it's because you like progressing in something or you like having goals that you can periodically meet. Um, yeah, maybe it's just because you like showing up for yourself and you like doing this for yourself. Um, yeah, think about your long-term and short-term goals and the mental um, satisfaction that you get from lifting. And once you return to that, you'll realize that taking time off entirely really just detracts from all of those goals. Whereas if you just modify things in the meantime, you can still keep going on part of those goals. Um, so yeah, why can't you make progress in, in that vein? Why can't you make progress in something else that you, instead of just putting more weight on the barbell? Um, you can, you can make progress in the other lifts or you can make progress in making sure that your lifts are balanced or we're gonna talk more about that so I don't wanna delve too much into it. But there's always ways to still be working towards your goal with your mass with your main goal in mind to while you're experiencing pain um so yeah write those goals be specific about them write them down um it, that will help you or someone that you're working with like really help you program correctly for um the meantime when you're not able to do all of the things that you were able to do and now i'll pass it over to john okay. <clears throat> yeah so uh in evaluating those goals, you know, and Holly said to be specific, really be, um, try to be uh, maybe approaching it in like a tiered approach where you have primary goals. You may have had primary goals of like increase squat, bench, and deadlift, increase my total, and then like, you know, maybe look better or something like that. But like really drill down and find all the sub goals that go with each of those because each lift has its own set of goals attached to it. Squats, you know, move more efficiently. Um, <clears throat> make it more balanced, make sure you have like that nice midfoot balance with squat, things like that, where you can really um, identify things that you're working on that occur on a training day to training day basis. That way when you have to scale back or have to do things differently, you have all these other goals that you still have to accomplish and you can still focus on and you can still get those wins in the day that you might otherwise have overlooked because you're focused more on the problem that's in front of you. <clears throat> So as coaches, we try to instill these uh, goals in our athletes and really to call them out as much as possible. Even with our healthy athletes, we do the same thing. We break things down and make sure that they know that 
okay, not only <clears throat> are you stronger today or things moved really well, but like, look at the balance on that. Like, look at how on that deadlift, you didn't let the bar get away from you at all. Like it stayed very mid foot. Your balance was really nice. The bar path on your squat was really great. All these things are really, really important. So, so, um, so again, try to drill down into your goals. Look at those to see, are there other things that I can be working on in the meantime? Because just because you have an injury doesn't mean that you need to turn off all of those things. You may not be able to barbell back squat. You may have to do something different. You may have to rely on that belt squat every single squat day, every single secondary squat day. You Anyone might have to just belt squat. Anyone who's had a low back issue has had to rely on the belt squat for all yes. of your volume, basically. But yes. it's a wonderful tool, which is why we have. <laughs> yeah. If you can't deadlift, uh, belt squat, belt again, squat. <laughs> is probably going to be your friend, unless for some reason that gives you pain as well. Because uh, even the act of bracing might, you know, actually <laughs> hurt as well. So that's another thing. Uh, but those all have small fixes. You may not be able to load up a bunch of weight to do those things. But those are still alterations you can make to your program to make sure that you can still walk in here. You can spend some time. You can get some leg volume in. You can get some work in and you can get some stimulus to feel better. And mentally, that's gonna do a lot for you. <clears throat> but the reason we mention improved weak points, everybody has weak points, whether you have weak points in your lifts that you can readily identify by how they move, uh, by your movement pattern, you might have weak points that you can see in the mirror. You know, you may see that, okay, well, I, maybe I need more like upper back musculature. Um, maybe, you know, if I wanna build my bench, I wanna make sure that I'm, uh, I've got enough muscle to sustain that, and I also wanna make sure that I'm stable in the movement. And more muscle mass is gonna to lead to more stability in the movement. More stability in the movement, more strength in the movement means that you have fewer weak points and you're probably less prone to getting hurt. And so that third point, building muscle mass, super important, always, it's kind of like it's glazed over. Of course you wanna build muscle mass, um, depending on what your goals are, of course. But if you wanna get stronger, building muscle mass is going to be one of those goals. <clears throat> All right, and the point with building muscle mass is not only making sure that you're, you're eating right to support that, but also that you are working just as hard on all those accessory movements that support that goal. We've had athletes in the past that they're like really hungry for that SBD and total, and they're like working really hard on those main lifts, but then when it comes to accessories, they view them as like quasi optional, or uh, if they were to like grade them on uh, importance, the main lifts are like way up here, and then accessories are, are downgraded slightly to where, okay, I'm gonna do the accessories, but I might not push on those quite as hard as I would with the same focus and intent as I will on my main lifts. And the difference between those athletes and the athletes that see SBD and all the accessories on the same level, and they approach them with the same level of intent and intensity, those are the athletes that are, uh, you can really tell the difference in the results that they get. <coughs> Uh, overall. And um, they are less likely to get injured as yes. well. Yeah, because they tend to be more mindful overall of the, the overall picture. All right, so taking action and what do you do? And again, this is more the center of the bell curve. This isn't an outlier situation, but this is a place to start if you do have aches and pains that pop up in the course of training and you're experiencing some pain. <clears throat> so we kind of broke it into two different um, categories. One on the left, gradual onset pain. These are the ones that seem to pop up sort of the most often uh, just do the, from the course of training overall. Things that you train one day and maybe the next day or maybe the day after that, all of a sudden you wake up and you have knee pain just like for whatever reason. Or you have um, this weird thing in your neck that now you can't turn your head as well or something like that. He's talking specifically about himself. Yes, I am talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was like digging an elbow in his trap yesterday. It's better. It's a lot better. It's now. better now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and it's the, the thing with that is that, um, I'll use myself as an example, there was no one thing that really led to that. Like it was the, the day before I felt through training, felt like not the greatest, but there was no one lift that led to the thing and then the next day I woke up and yeah like turning my head one way was not not really happening and my shoulder blade was feeling pretty locked up something was just guarded in there but regardless of what happened um, that's just the state that I was in so there's I don't think there was anything that I could have done on my squat and my bench and the other accessories that would have uh, reversed that other than maybe not going in that day but maybe not maybe I just would have woke up that way anyway anyhow um, <clears throat> So that's the type of gradual onset pain we're talking about. 
you want to determine the specific area of the pain or discomfort. I don't mean like, okay, my knee hurts. That's not specific enough. You really want to know like where in your knee, if you can, uh, where this is happening. And this is helpful for two reasons. One, um, you can hopefully figure out, okay, well, about where is it? And then try some gentle stretching, some foam rolling, maybe a lacrosse wall or something like that on some of the upstream areas that might affect that. That's one reason you want to be really specific. The other reason you want to be specific is if you do go see a PT or a doctor, you can communicate what is happening so that you can be your own advocate. <clears throat> um, a lot of times if someone comes in and they just say they have knee pain, I don't know, I've been to sports med doctors a few times and the care that I got wasn't that stellar. Like they're not gonna drill down with you that long in the, in the room to find out what's really happening with you. Uh, they were very quick to say, okay, well, we could do a cortisone shot. Um, you know, maybe you can go get a massage or, you know, if you're really worried about it, we can do imaging. And then they basically like stood there and, you know, what do you want to do? <laughs> so it, that's kind of the deal that, that I went through at least. But um, it helps to specifically say like where things are hurting so that they can actually help you. Um, so once you figure out where that is, you want to figure out, okay, can you get a full range of motion out of it, just body weight without any resistance or anything. So try body weight squats. Um, if it's a shoulder thing or something that's happening, you don't necessarily want to do a bench press even with a bar, lay down on a bench, just move your arms in the path and see if you can do that. Um, that may be a, a no-go or it may be great. So then you can start loading up a little bit, you know, a very light plate, very light dumbbell uh, and start to progress from there to see if, um, if weight is the problem or if range of motion is the problem. And this is different from the fuck around and find out model because you're taking it very yes. slow and you will stop if the pain gets worse. You won't just be like, well, you know, like what if I add on five kilos, does it, does it get better or does it get worse? Mm -hmm. No, if you no. feel the pain, you then stop. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll mention again later about a pain rating scale. So um, we always talk about a pain rating scale and this is something that's becoming more popular is that you want to subjectively evaluate your pain on a scale of one to 10. If it's like less than a three, that's sort of a better zone to try to test things out very conservatively, very, very conservatively. But anything over that, you really need to scale back and find a way to get that pain down below that threshold so that you're not pushing it too far. And this isn't just about tissue damage. This is about creating positive experiences with the lifts and with your body so that your brain can stop sending the pain signal if there's no tissue damage. It will not stop sending the pain signal even if there's no tissue damage if you don't give it positive experiences. So this is actually like the most powerful mm -hmm. thing, which is why you have to guard it and take. Yeah. This is why we have procedures around everything so that you can follow these and you can trust like, mm -hmm. If I'm doing something okay. And you may need to scale way, way, way back. Um, and uh, I'll sp I can I can give you my experience, Errol. With uh, I had a similar thing three years ago, mm -hmm. four, oh, might be four years, might be four years ago now. It feels like it was not that long ago, but it was I think four years ago. Yeah. Um, I was in the same situation where like getting out of bed was hard. Tying my shoes was really hard. Um, it was everyday things and it was every day for a very long time. <clears throat> and uh, I ended up having to go to the bare minimum of doing things like empty bar. And then after a while, finally add 10 pounds and then 10 pounds over the course of several weeks. Like it was a very slow um, ramp up. <clears throat> it was a long process, but it was uh, probably I always say this is that I got a lot out of that process, oh, yeah. even yeah. though it really sucked. Um, and we've used, we've repeated that process with uh, several athletes as we well have. with uh, success yeah. actually. And they'll yes. get back to, and they get back to like full what they were doing before. Mm -hmm. But it's once again about creating the positive experiences so that you will mm -hmm. stop feeling that pain yes. signal. And if you can't load up 155 and feel the positive experience of it, then don't load up 155. Yeah. Like you need to get the pain signal to go down. Yeah. And what it did force me to do was take a very, very microscopic look at all my lifts to make sure that, that they were correct, <laughs> that my technique was really dialed in. And then I did not let things like a little bit of lateral travel in a deadlift, like I did not let that bar get away from me even by like an inch or a half an inch. Um, just those little things to really nitpick and be really pedantic about it. It built up my lifts in ways and built up my ability to talk about lifting and to teach other people lifting 
really did a lot for that. <clears throat> Not so, necessarily a lesson you want to learn. No. <laughs> but a very valuable no. one nonetheless. No. So, okay, okay, so go through these processes. You make sure that um, you find a range of motion that works. It might be a partial range of motion. You may have to get creative with your programming. And by the way, we're going to do a little interactive thing with a block where uh, we'll bring up a block that's for just as you are if you're healthy. And then we'll take some suggestions on like, if you have this kind of pain or this kind of pain, what would you do to the block, the training block over the course of four weeks to change the movements to make it still doable, but not exacerbate the, the problem. So we'll do that exercise in a little bit um, to be more specific and maybe more helpful with your specific mm -hmm. training. But once you find a um, you know, range of motion that works, you may have to do a half squat. You may find that you have to do like something really specific, like a, a top banded squat where it takes weight off as it goes lower um, to be able to do the movement and not feel pain. There are a lot of substitutions that you can make to make sure that you can still come in the gym and do it. But if the pain still lingers, uh, you know, still you need to continue to reduce the weight, reduce reps. And um, if, uh, if you can't find a pain-free movement, either eliminate that type of movement altogether as a worst case, um, but you probably should see somebody at the same time to make sure that you're not doing anything to too damaging to it. <clears throat> the other type of pain that we're going to look at is sudden onset pain. So these are very acute things that happen. You pretty much know right when they happen. Um, you know, deadlifting, your back pops, benching, shoulder pops, doing an overhead press, the same thing, all those things. <clears throat> but we, uh, you can sort of delineate those into two types of pain, dull and achy, sharp and stabby. The sharp and stabby ones are the ones you want to really work, look out for. Um, those are the things that are super acute, super fast. Um, they they tend to hurt a lot. And for those, generally you need to just stop. And if you can't find any body weight, range of motion or anything that works for those, that's where you need to go see somebody and just have that checked out. Um, and then the dull icky pains, those tend to be more like muscular, mm -hmm. you know, where you have- Something's tight. Something's tight, something's guarded. Seized up on you. Um, you know, knees are common for that, you know, where, mm. where some tension in a, in a quad or something is pulling your kneecap in one direction and then that that makes it feel strange sometimes the pain like rotates around the kneecap it'll sh like shift um, those are fun but that's <laughs> <coughs> where you can't really tell where the pain's coming from um, but that's that's where um, foam rolling and stretching is kind of a good first line defense on those just to see if you can get things to loosen up and to get that to be less guarded maybe even soft tissue work mm -hmm. soft tissue work go find a PT that mm -hmm. that really knows uh, the sport, knows lifters and what they go through and what they do. And that's another thing that's, you know, if you find a professional, make sure that they know your sport, at least somewhat, where they know about lifters, they know what you do and they're supportive of it rather than, you know, discouraging of it and saying, well, you probably shouldn't squat ever. It's one of the like back to the mindset things. You need to have someone yeah. who's supportive of what you want to do. Because as soon as someone tells you to not do it, that's the first thing you're going to want to do. You want to trust these people. You're in a vulnerable state, right? Okay, so <clears throat> just to recap, pain occurs during lifting. Find a range of motion that you can do just with your body. Uh, slowly introduce weights after that once you figure that out. And does range of motion affect it? Maybe it's just weight. You know, maybe there's a threshold, a hard threshold when you get to, you know, a red um, on each side of the bar that that's, that's what starts to trigger the pain. Stay below that threshold um, until you can uh, basically wait it out to let your body heal itself. <clears throat> and with, um, with pain outside of lifting, so again, like the sort of delayed onset pain, if that makes sense, pain that appears another day after training, same type of deal. Find a range of motion that works for you. <clears throat> um, find movements that work for you. And um, <clears throat> try to trace it back to, to things that make sense that might have exacerbated, that, that might have caused the pain. So for, um, you know, for a shoulder, it might have been bench press or it might have been something else. You might have been doing a row or something else that, that like you flexed in a weird way or moved in a strange way and that's, that's what happens. So just make sure that you know what it is that might have caused it so that you can take different steps. And um, things like warming up and, um, yeah, warming up protocols, that might help you with that for sure.
Well, yeah, and making sure that you're moving outside of training too. So if you have like a desk job, mm. making sure that you are taking random and regular breaks to get up and walk around and like actually move your body. Walking is one of the biggest um, ways to stop pain, actually. Like just regular walking, mm. like two 15 minute walks a day and then maybe two 20 minute walks a day. I'm not talking about an hour at one time. That's probably not a good idea unless you're regularly walking an hour at one time. But just short walks. Um, it gets things moving, it gets blood flowing, it gets uh, fluids moving through your body too, which helps your body then heal itself. I don't think we can overstate walking. No, walking really is, it think. sounds like we're just saying go for a walk. No, no. It's really not go for a walk. It's Walking has helped so many of our people get back in the gym, get back training like normal, mm -hmm. and it doesn't take very long typically. If you track it, something like eight to 12,000 mm -hmm. steps a day would be like super ideal. If you're getting yes. only like two to 4,000 steps a day, that's a very, that's, that's that very much puts you in the range of you might injure yourself. Like it just allows time for muscles to get tight. Um, specifically, if you have a seated job, you're gonna get tight hip flexors. And when you get tight hip flexors, then you're gonna have tight glutes. And like everything starts to kind of go downhill after that. Walking is magical. Usually back things too. Yeah, lots of driving, huge lots of with back things. Not great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, Low back, hip, yeah. There's a, there's a book called The Back Mechanics by Stuart McGill. It's a, uh, have you have you seen that book yet? We yeah. have copy. We, we have, have a copy, copy, and we have a copy of <clears throat> yeah. Rebuild My Lower. Yeah, yeah, McGill is kind of one of those mm -hmm. big back gurus, but he's big about walking. The yes. walk, and the walking part is like definitely true. He emphasizes that. I, I want to say that's in every almost every chapter. It's mm -hmm. like you need to be walking. If you're not walking, you're yep. basically not motivated enough to to heal your back, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and you should be doing it a lot. He's got some like particular stretches and stuff like that too, yes. but really it's centered around bringing blood flow and movement to the area so that your body can heal itself. He's also not a big proponent of surgery. Uh, he talks a lot about Much more conservative. Um, yeah, he talks a lot about imaging and how imaging tends to uh, sort of give people validation for the pain that they're experiencing. So it's like, okay, well I'm experiencing pain because I have this that showed up on this image. But he said that most people have things that show up on imaging. Uh, and have no symptoms and vice versa. They'll mm -hmm. have symptoms, but nothing show up on imaging. So um, yeah, this has like been shown the, for, yeah. The, the correlation between the two is not super great. Um, so it's not necessarily the, the route you wanna take unless like you really have a major problem, like you're considering what the conclusion to the imaging might be, um, you know, surgery or whatever. Right. Yeah. Or if your quality of life is so poor that you like need something to fix it. Like if you're not able to walk around yeah. and do regular life things and you have some like, you know, cartilage is out of place. Like there are reasons why, yes. why surgery would be the right option. There's just, usually they promote a more conservative way if possible. If you're, you know, everyday life is not horrible or you only experience it during lifting, um, if you can make these modifications and you can keep going and then you can keep your mind well, that's probably the best way to go about most things. Now, some things absolutely will need to be like reattached or, you know, like cleaned out. Um, but regardless, but, we have a copy of the book. It's actually in the class Yeah, space. yeah, and it's available for loan to yes. anybody who wants to borrow it. Yeah, and, we'll and get other copies rebuilding if we need to. Milo too. We have another. We have one oh, by yeah. um, mm -hmm. Aaron Horshig or whatever. I don't know how to say his name. Um, the Squat You guy, yeah, basically. Horshig. Yeah. Yeah, we have his book too. Yeah, feel free to But barbell those. medicine has also, you know, everyone has delved into this imaging versus actual pain and they don't they don't always match up. In fact, they mostly don't match up. Anyone over 30 is going to have a disc issue. A disc is going to be out of place or slipped and have no pain referencing there mm -hmm. whatsoever. So if you go in with back pain, well, of course they're going to find a slipped disc and of course you're going to say because you've seen that now, "Oh, well that's because of the slipped disc." Yeah when you may have had that before and you would have no way of knowing it. So in other words, be very cautious with imaging. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I got x-rays, my first knee issue that I had, and the, the first thing they said was, oh, you have arthritis in your knee. Like, okay, well, I, I, this was like a year after starting lifting. I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know that, you know, <laughs> suddenly I have arthritis. I'm sure I'm, yes. I'm almost 40 years old, so I, I probably have arthritis. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't think that was my problem, um, but anyway. Oh, if we can take a quick question break yes. so I can scoop this ice cream for oh. Janelle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
<clears throat> Let me ask her what kind she wants. You, if you are so inclined that you can, I mentally just like think I just cannot. Like I just don't think I can even get it off the ground if I switch to the other side. Um, so I, for me, it was switching to hook. Uh, but if you can switch, absolutely, mm -hmm. you should be switching. Mm -hmm. But also, yeah. if you do tend to kick it out on your underhand side, that's that's a really good opportunity to really drill down into Slow that. Slow into like, the wedge. For some area. people, mixed grip is is the only way. Yeah, that's the only way you're going to get that yeah, bar off the ground at heavy weight. So be more intentional with it and try to get that movement to not kick it out. You may have to go much slower up floor. Mm -hmm. You know. You may not be able to wedge so aggressively because sometimes mm -hmm. the aggressive wedge, wedge is part of what pushes it mm -hmm. out. Um, so you may have to just be like very slow with it, create your tension while you're already down there and then go with it. That way you make sure that you, you can't kick it out because you're not wedging into it anymore. Um, so yeah, you may just have to try that too. I mean, I recommend hook obviously also, but if that's just not the way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm a hook rib supremacist. <laughs> Welcome. I watched by, uh, uh, I think Eugene Teo was in it, and uh -huh. they called the Candido Hook Grip. You okay. just search for Candido Hook Grip uh -huh. um, on YouTube. It was like a 20 minute video, the next time I went to the gym, no problem. Mm. Uh, I just, I've been hooking every set uh, from now until it's going to be like other issues. <laughs> Cool. Candido hook grip. Huh? Yeah. I've never. I don't think I've ever watched this yeah. video Candido on it. Candido usually does have good. To yeah. When he goes yeah. and actually does like tutorials, is good. Particular like way, like it's not like a different hook grip. It's just the way it was taught. Just mm -hmm. like made sense to me. Yeah. yeah. And like I don't have enormous hands. I'm five foot five. <laughs> but you do have. Let's see your thumbs. You got decent. They're plenty long. long yeah. Some people yeah. actually have these little short stubby thumbs. And it really sucks for them. It looks like everyone's thumbs here you've, you've are got, just, yeah. wow, yeah. Your thumb is, you, you are fine. Yeah, I mean, yeah. my palms are, like, I have bigger hands, but my yeah. palms are bigger than my fingers are long. Yeah, so yeah. I do still feel like bare paws on the bar sometimes. Uh-huh, so uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, no, I can see that. The palm is bigger. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, but some people's actually, like, their just fingers are too short or their thumb is just actually too short and, like, clubby that they literally yep. cannot. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we, have, you, we, have, we have an athlete that's that, for mm -hmm. sure, and I have an athlete that's, that's like that. Mm -hmm. And I have another one who's so tiny, like, she, like, has trouble holding the barbell in mixed grip, like, because it's just, you know, she's, she's like, yay tall. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, do we have but, any other questions before yeah, we yeah, um, any move other? on? Yeah, yeah, any other? Say a comment, not a question, yeah. but... For sure, being like I like what you said about if you do seek medical attention, of being as specific as possible. That's so huge. Mm -hmm. Because like if you think about it from the healthcare side, most of those people who are seeing you have like 15 to 30 minutes per patient, mm -hmm. and including their note writing time, and they're seeing like 20 people a day. Yeah. Like if you can't go in and be like, this is exactly what's going on. This range of motion. When I do this, it's repeatable or not or whatever mm -hmm. like in this area like they just don't have time yeah they so, don't yeah. they really it's don't it's unfortunate but it's like like that specificity is huge to like actually get something actionable out of yep. or a surgeon or whoever else yeah it's true yeah it's true yep. yeah yeah and if you go into a pt it saves them time they're going to dry needle you mm -hmm. they know where to zero in you yep. know rather than having to take you through the full assessment of where is yep. the pain and how is the pain and all that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. And it, it's worth going to the same PT or the same doctor over and over, and over again, obviously, because then they develop, they have, get more of an understanding of what it is that you do and where you likely will have pains and they'll understand your muscular imbalances and things like that. So basically, the more you get to know the PT or the um, sports med doctor, the better your treatment will get, obviously. So, in other words, don't hop around. It's not great to hop around. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, also, wanted to say thank you guys for doing this. Um, super helpful and relevant for me right now. <laughs> it's relevant. Yeah, it's, it is. Yeah, we're we're happy to do it. We really needed to share this information. I wish that we had done it a long time ago, actually. Yeah. But, it, but it does happen to be very relevant, particularly right now for you. <laughs> and I hope you don't mind. I mentioned like what you're oh, yeah. kind of going through. Okay. It's not something that you would necessarily all coaches are going to have the information we just happen to have injured ourselves a lot and we also happen to have um like had athletes come to us already injured and maybe not tell us for a little while and then they're like they're like casually mentioned that they can't bend over and tie their shoes and we're like what and you've been doing mm -hmm. this programming and you can't tie your shoes like that's not okay 
<laughs> and they're just trying to be a good athlete, yeah, really. Just, I mean, that's their point of view do... is that they're just trying to get the work done exactly. and to make their coach proud of them. And, um, you know, they feel like... They feel like it might be normal. Yeah, well, they feel yeah. like if they don't do the things in the program that they're, like, not Letting doing what they're supposed down, to do, even or, though yeah. they have pain outside of the thing. No, yeah. like, our, our job as coaches is to, like, if you're going through that, let's find a way to not go through that. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, because there's always a way. You know, there's always yeah. a way. Um, so now we can talk specifically about some movement modifications that you might want to make to your program or that you might want to have your coach make to your program. Um, these are primary modifications. This would be like first line, what we would prefer to do as the very first thing if you're experiencing pain and lifting. Um, for squats, um, you, first thing is range of motion. So reduce the range of motion as minimal as possible to not produce pain or produce pain at a two to three. And I'm not telling you specifically a two to three. See your doctor, see what they say. But from what we've heard from our own specific doctors, they say to cap at like a two or three. Three if you are like a low pain threshold person. Two if you're a high pain threshold person. Um, and you probably know the answer to that, whether or not you can take a lot of pain or not very much pain. Um, so for squats, we'd want to look at, I would say pin squats would be a primary modification. Um, putting the pin at a height that is sustainable that like, let's say you're having knee pain, but you don't really have the knee pain until you get to about here. So you want to put the pins right above where you're having the pain. Um, set the pins like that. Uh, box squats would be a different modification. So putting the box, um, we have that box that's like an adjustable height, or you could, um, get a different box. Can or um, you can stack up what? I was just going to add something to that too. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's, it's with squats. It's like it could be very specific to where the act of loading and unloading on your spine hurts, versus somebody that can do that, but the act of squatting hurts. And so you may have to find a way, like pin squats, for example, at the bottom when you rest on the pins, it takes the load off your spine and then reloads it when you stand back up. If that hurts, don't do a pin squat. Yeah. Do either a box squat. Or do a just a, a half squat, you mm -hmm. know, do just a three quarter squat. squat to there and then come back up again. And you will eventually be able to squat slightly lower. If you are very astute and you can stop yourself at a certain height, that would be preferable, probably squatting high. But if you just tend to like get in a mood and then you like go into your <laughs> squat, maybe you want to set pins or do a box or something like that. A box would take it more out of the knees too, because you're going to be sitting back onto a box or you're going to have less forward knee travel, which means you're not going to work your quads as much. So a box squat would be preferable if you're having knee pain. Um, for bench, you could do pin, pin press. So setting the pins at a height that doesn't cause pain or block. Um, so you can attach that block to the barbell and we have variable heights of blocks or you can find variable heights of blocks. So you can set that. Oh, we're going to get the duck with the, with the tongue. The we should, tongue like, sticks mm, out. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You've reached, that's your spot. I press one. You, when you attach the little, put the little duck on your, and he spits at you. Um, so yes, Botto, if you can reduce your range of motion by yourself or just do like half top, half reps, or you could have someone lean it down to you and hold off the weight if the bottom half doesn't hurt, but let's say you've injured your tricep or something like that, that the top half works, but you can do the bottom half. Um, yeah, you can, there's all kinds of modifications you can make here. Uh, for deadlifts, you pretty much got block pulls or rack pulls basically, but there are other, so those are basically your only primary modifications for deadlifts, um, but we have secondary and modifications that we can go to. Um, so these are the secondary modifications. So if the first ones are producing more pain than like a three out of 10, you'd probably want to move on down to this level, which would be where your secondary lifts can become your primary lifts. So for squats, that could be high bar squat. Like if you're having some like low back pain or something during squats, the more anterior loading of a high bar squat might feel okay, um, or an SSB, or if it's the spinal loading on the squat that's bothering you, you may want to just um, switch to belt squat just to get your leg work in. Um, and then you can do some core work, some gentle core work too, you know, that, yeah, squats are more than just legs, obviously. Um, for bench, you can try a closer grip. You can try a wider grip than usual. Um, yeah, and that can take it out of your shoulders or if you have an elbow pain or something like that, that can help. Or, um, yeah, a Swiss bar, either that grip or that grip or neutral grip, dumbbells. You can try a variety of things as your secondary lift um, to get the pain to go away. 
alternate stance for deadlift is our big one. So like if you do conventional as your main deadlift, but conventional hurts, maybe you want to try sumo. It's a little bit less spinal loading, a little bit more um, quad loading. So it can be uh, a good tool to have if, you're, if deadlifts are hurting you. Um, or if you, that doesn't work because it's still hurting you, you could try SSB just to get some leg and core work in. Or once again, down to the belt squat. So belt squat is like a, a saver for everything if you can't do any of this other stuff. Even if you're a sumo puller. Um, I had back problems for a while and I'm a sumo puller. Uh, I did sumo belt squat. Mm -hmm, just a wider belt squat and then just like, you know. Pretend the put your, Yeah, exactly. Pretend that you've got a barbell there. I did there. that for quite a while. And yeah, you're, that way you're still working the same musculature, but you're not spinal loading at all. Yep. And then like, let's say you can work your upper back. Maybe you could do rows, like seated cable rows wouldn't be bugging your low back. Like you can always be working around it. Um, specifically for back, you want to be working core things too. Um, yeah. What is SSB? Oh, that's a safety squat bar. That's the bar that does like that. Okay. Yeah, it's a yeah. really good one. Yeah. Yes. That Something one is specifically good if you got shoulder. Squat. Safety squat bar. Yeah. Something SSB. we don't talk too much about is like we mentioned a little bit the rotational and anti rotational yes. things uh, to mix in for accessories. But mm -hmm. I guess we can talk about that with the block modification. Yeah, I think so. That would be a good idea yeah. to talk about that. Yeah. Um, so this is the tertiary modification. So let's say the primary and the secondary did no good. You're still experiencing three plus in pain. Um, this is where you probably want to mm, just go straight to a doctor, go see somebody about this, um, have a PT look at you, somebody uh, ask your, your people who they recommend. You can ask in general. General is a great place with people from Discord, all over. Chat. Yeah, our general chat is a really great place where um, people will tell you who they've gone to and they trust. Um, we have our own people, but they, you know, like there's other great people out there too. It's not just Joelle. Um, once you've eliminated the likelihood by seeing a doctor, once you've eliminated the likelihood of an actual injury to tissue, um, yeah, just basically eliminate the movement that's causing the pain for a little while. Do other things, literally work on a different body part. Like, you know, unless it's, unless you're having like a shoulder, low back and knee pain, chances are you can work on something that won't cause pain. So yeah, unless you've completely fallen apart. And in which case, like, can you do core work? <laughs> Go in and get some really nice biceps or triceps for a little while. Um, all right, so these are some common in a efficiencies and movement is this like this is where our videos come in yeah and then so we didn't okay. assign this to either of us this that's is right sort we're just gonna like we're gonna ping pong it yeah. yeah we'll ping pong it so yeah. these are things that if you have to do like focus <laughs> on other like secondary tertiary goals yeah, in your training um look at you know how efficient your squats are looking for little things to optimize um to perfect to make sure that you don't get injured again to make sure that you're not exacerbating an existing pain point uh, these are just common things that we see, like some of the most common ones. Not an exhaustive list. Some of these are very exaggerated examples <laughs> of inefficiencies. Yeah. And one of them is like, you know, you may have to look a few times before you see mm -hmm. it. We, we have trained eyes specifically for this person and their inefficient movement. So we know exactly what is we're looking at. <laughs> but um, yeah, let's just... This person particularly has a... Um, I, can, I can do the... Okay, yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> this person is one of our athletes, been with us for a very long time, and um, she has a hip shift on one side. It's not a knee valgus, really, but it's a hip shift. And if you watch when she comes up out of the squat, you see that her hip shifts there. over there, and then it, she tries to like yeah. shift it back. Um, what this has caused is it's caused... Um, patellar femoral pain, I believe it was. No, mm. knee tracking. They, I can't remember what she's, she's been That's, to doctors about this. Um, but basically, one of her glutes is stronger than the other, so it's causing her to shift onto that other side where she's getting knee pain And just to point out side. what this is, so if you think of a box, watch her hips go down, and then they're gonna shift this way and up. Mm -hmm. Just and shift to the side, and then they reshift back and to they the other back. side. So you'll see it's just like a. There's a point she gets where it's like, okay, I can go back to the middle. It's like you know, mm -hmm. that shift back to center happens pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it does. And what's really strange is on the first couple, first few reps, you won't see that. 
it's only when she gets into higher reps that the fatigue sets in and then she starts shifting. So uh, one of the things that we did with her was um, we had her do a lot of single leg work and we have her doing a lot of single leg work now to really strengthen up that weak side. Bulgarian split squats, everyone loves them. Other lunges or split squats are great too. You do have to watch how much forward knee travel movement you have and you make sure that you balance. We'll show you what a well-balanced program looks like, but you do have to balance it with hamstring work. Otherwise you end up with knee pain. Yes. Um, which so, is very common. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When, you, when you shift the single leg work to work on these imbalances, do you try to match the motion of the single leg work to what happens in your bilateral movement, or do you try to go all the way in the other direction? So, example, if you normally externally rotate mm -hmm. wide open hips and mm -hmm. you shift the single leg, do you want to see that mimicked, or do you want to see us do what we normally don't do, which is, no, go ahead, take advantage of this setup to rotate in more? I wouldn't necessarily try to rotate in more because chances are if you're externally rotating, it's because something needs to externally rotate and you yeah. could jack something up by screwing with that. So I wouldn't, I would say if it's something gentle like walking, working on your rotation during walking is great because it's very low impact. But I personally, I wouldn't want to see you change your, um, yeah. your rotation and on anything like that. To add to that, so when you squat, your hips um, are oriented in a certain way and you're going to have a certain stance with a, a certain amount of toe out. But when you switch to single leg work, that may not translate at all. Like mm -hmm. you may be very toes forward in yeah, the yeah, single yeah. leg version of that or somewhere in between. So we don't want you to necessarily do the exact same amount of external rotation right. if you're doing a squat, for example. It needs to be whatever, however your body moves naturally in that single leg variant. That, so feel it and feel it out. And if it, don't push it if it's feeling like it wants to fight you on it. That does, that's not a sign that, oh, I must be really weak with this. Usually that's a sign of your body doesn't want to move in that way and it probably yeah. shouldn't move and in, in that way. In that case, it's probably that right glute that is the culprit, like just not mm -hmm. being as developed as the left one. So she has to compensate out of the hole to make that hip extension happen. Um, so that's why we're having her do just more glute work overall, mm -hmm. including single leg work. Yep. Um, and specifically with the single leg glute work, making sure that, like, we have our video it, because it's really easy when you have a weak glute to, like, lean into your Bulgarian split squats, and then you're not using your glute, you're using your quad. So making sure that she's very upright on those and, like, very specific. Um, I also find it helpful and weird, but literally feel the glute that is supposed to be working and make sure that you are feeling it do work like sometimes you may not like actually yeah. make a mind muscle connection really literally it's a kind of a bodybuilding trick actually the like either test. watching it or poke it like literally poke mm -hmm. the muscle to feel it yeah and that makes your brain be like oh this is working okay and so yeah that's why you'll see a lot of personal trainers like poking people too because there it is proven you yeah. poke that's it or watch you should it be using right now yes, <laughs> yes. jab it yes um, another way to help combat some of that besides all the single leg work is uh, controlling the movement. So th you notice that happens on the concentric portion, the way up. So having her control the concentric portion of the squat does tend to help a little bit. Um, it doesn't add to it. So a lot of people kind of like shit on c controlling concentric work because it doesn't add to strength, right? Like it's proven. But it does add to movement efficiency. Mm -hmm. So if we can have her control it, and like pay attention to the shift and like subtly correct it, um, that will help correct the muscular yeah, imbalance. Muscle connection is huge. Yeah, it is. And also this, um, so this squat pattern, this little inefficiency, that's what it looks like from the back. From the front, it looks totally different. Yeah. That's usually that right knee is gonna cave in, the left knee's not, and you can even watch the feet. Watch. Sometimes you'll see, not only will you see that right leg cave in like this, but you'll also see this heel pop up. Mm -hmm. Or she's got really flexible ankles, but you'll notice the ankle will like shift yes. in like so. Um, she happens to be hypermobile also, which is a struggle. Yes. Um, this is, did it go? Oh, here, I think because it's not. Uh, oh, okay. Hold on. Oh no. What happened? I don't know. So okay. There we go. All right. <laughs> this is my like shitty version of an anterior pelvic tilt during a squat. So that's basically where you, you'll notice some people want to squat like so. Uh, yeah, that's more like a, yeah, it's like a good morning too. Like I'm trying to good morning oh, it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I got laughed at. I was like, I promise I'm really trying to show sh <laughs> shitty squats. Reputation um, ruined. <laughs> <laughs> the weirdest good morning I've ever seen. Isn't it? It's really bad. It's really bad. Um, so in a, in a case like this, what we would work on would be lower abdominals to help 
strength in here, which will pull the tilt forward. Some people just like actually have an anterior pelvic tilt, and what that signifies is that their their abdominals are not strong enough to be pulling them forward. Also, technical changes. So learning how to brace properly by like putting your ribs into the belt, tucking your ribs into the belt is um, that's how you should be bracing for squats. I want to explain that. Yeah, yeah go, want you want to do it now? Yeah, I'll do yeah, that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right. So. Um, yeah, look at your squat and see if you're doing this at any point in your squat, whether it's from the unrack, whether it's when you brace, or as you go down into the holes, because sometimes that back extension doesn't happen until you get low enough for it to happen, and then you'll see just a little bit of that extension happening. It won't look like that. Like That's a very no. exaggerated example. No, it may happen when you're all the way down in the hole, but to try to prevent that from happening and to keep a more neutral spine, um, it can help if this is something that um, that we started doing and we started sort of coaching other people to do after we went to a seminar in Virginia um, led by actually our two coaches. Yeah, our coaches. <clears throat> um, I said, so when you unrack the bar, if you're prone to extension or anterior pelvic tilt, exhale all the air from your body. Like forcibly exhale and watch what happens to my ribs when I do that. <sighs> they go down. And if you're naturally just like a ribs really flared lifter, instead of bracing into your chest and into your belly with that, you want to exhale before you unrack. Bring it more neutral. Then unrack the bar. So now you've got the weight of the bar on your back forcing you into that more neutral position. And then that's where you take your brace into your belt. But basically you can't get into that position again because you're, the, the weight is then pushing your ribs yeah. into your belt. And it's not, you don't necessarily want to unrack the bar. Not everyone's going to do it that way because some people are naturally folded over already in the squat. They already have like back flexion just happening and you need to get them to have a little bit more extension to stay more upright and to stay more rigid in the squat. So your cues for them are going to be different. But if you're the kind of squatter that you get a little bit of extension, maybe your brace falls apart when it gets heavy, try that to try to even things out and to hold a stronger brace. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and also you'll, you'll notice that in this particular video, I'm breaking this, and this is an old school sort of cue too that is still alive out there for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. It's based in um, equipped lifting. So it'll be to break back with your hips first. You should not be breaking back with your hips first unless you're an equipped lifter. You should be breaking with the knees first. Knees first. If you notice, if I break with my hips first, then I, I go down like this, and then where's the barbell? Over the middle of the foot, and I don't got, and I don't got, I don't have any forward knee travel. I can't because the barbell is so far forward. Like, first of all, I can't, I can't get depth. Like, there's no way I can get depth. I'm gonna have to fold like an accordion to get depth. Um, second of all, the bar, the barbell is over the middle of the foot. This is gonna cause, could cause quad pain, could cause low back pain because what I'm gonna have to do on the way up, it's I'm, just gonna good I'm gonna have to good yeah. morning it basically. So it's gonna put the shearing force right here in the low back. Um, and it can be very subtle and still you may have low back pain from mm -hmm. squatting um, for that particular reason. Um, so what you wanna do instead is break with the knees. When you break with the knees, you are obviously breaking with the hips instead. But if you think break with the knees first, the hips will follow directly at the same time. Or if you think breaking with the hips first, then the knees come second. Break with the knees. And this is not to say that if you have to do a box squat for you for might have to reason, break with the hips. You might have to squat. break with the hips first, but you're still going to try to keep the center of mass over the middle of your foot mm -hmm. always. Unless you are really having a, a serious knee mm -hmm. problem, in which case you may not want to keep it over the middle of the foot. You may want to shift the weight a little bit to the back and mm -hmm. just work posterior chain. I would personally recommend doing that on a belt squat better. It's a little bit safer to do it on a belt squat than a barbell um, seated, good more, uh, seated box squat because um, mm -hmm. you can go heavy and then you can hurt something else. Yeah. Um, next one. Oh, oh wait, yeah, you got to. Yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. No, that's the worst squat. <laughs> this is really bad. This one actually, I like hurt myself doing this one. Oh, Don't no. do this. <laughs> I just like was too that's overzealous dedication. with it. You'll see a lot of a lot of people, a lot of people bouncing on the bench. Obviously, no one here is going to be <laughs> bouncing on the bench. We've had people come into clinics and do this, and they're like going at it. 
It's not good. We have had people do that. And then I know I happen yeah. to know the wife of that person, and they literally tore a peck. Mm. So you can tear a peck by doing this. Be basically, um, yeah, controlling. No one here does that, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But um, if you do have problems in the bench press, strengthening, doing your isolation exercise is really huge. The incline press machine, uh, dumbbell, bench, uh, Larson press is a really big um for uh, just straight, strict strength. No one here does that. Um, All right. And just to yeah, comment on the bench press issue too. So um, with benching in particular, warming up for bench, it's really easy to move the bar however you want to, especially the stronger your bench is. So um, it's really easy to just basically be able to bring the bar down to your chest and go straight up with like no efficiency whatsoever because you can, like you're strong enough to do it. And that's not necessarily the best pattern to get into because you're going to, when things get real, your body's going to default to what it does most of the time. And if that thing is inconsistent, then what's going to happen? So you want to make sure you try to move the bar with the same path, regardless of how easy it is to move the bar. Um, what about bicep pain? I have. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. for sure. Um, Mine usually goes to straight to the elbow, but maybe well, it's probably bicep tendon, I'm guessing. My natural bench press is tempo. Slow, tempo yeah. Like yeah. Um, for me, when that pops up, that usually tells me that I'm going too heavy too often. And if I don't chill out on that right away, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And that's one of the, one of the pains that um, time off actually has helped. Um, like just letting it chill completely. I've tried everything from, again, this is anecdotal. This is just what I've found. Um, I've tried flossing, you know, where you get a, a light band and you tie it, not quite like blood flow restriction tight, but tight enough to where when you do this movement, you can feel um, there's some friction there. And to try to get some friction going in that joint to try to, you know, they would say, you know, get the cobwebs out or whatever. But, um, I've tried that. Um, I've tried doing extra curls because that, that's just like things that you do. I haven't found anything that really works with that bicep tendonitis that gets to the point where it's like I can't bench anymore. That's usually when it's time to just chill out and let it, let it cool off for a while. <clears throat> uh, but again, very anecdotal. I don't even Are know. Are you benching the same heavy multiple times a week or not really? Um, I don't think it's really heavy. Okay. Um, I mean, like if you look at my numbers, I, I never really go to heavy. Yeah. Um, How about RPE? Seven, maybe okay. eight, like mm -hmm. twice in the block. Um, mm. Okay. But yeah, I, I have that thing that maybe, like you were mentioning earlier, where I have like power and strength for like a short time. So like, just I think volume in general just isn't great with my body. Mm. So. Mm. Do, is it weight based? Like once you get to a certain weight, or like literally unloading? Yeah, like on any given day, like once it gets to a certain difficulty, um, the bicep pain sort of comes in, mm. and it's pretty consistent. Huh. What do are your warm ups you look like? Yeah. I wear wrist wraps. Okay. What do your warm ups look like? Um, I like how many sets? How many reps per per set? So I was doing multiple reps, um, each set, and incrementing less, like we're having less sets. So doing maybe a couple more sets, but just doing one rep um, per set. Um, I think that maybe helps a little bit more. But okay. It's definitely still there. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about warm-up schemes also. Um, just that might be a little bit helpful. And if that doesn't touch on it, then you can go around again. Mm -hmm. I would also try the all fours belly breathing too, just to oh, try yeah. it because there's. I was having elbow pain from bench for a very long time, and I was just about at my wit's end. It was only during bench, and I knew it was bench, knew it was caused by bench, um, and it was bicep resonating into the elbow. Um, so I told my coach finally, I was like, I'm going to go, I just to let you know, I'm going to see a PT about this elbow thing, and he's like, try us this all four belly breathing before you go to the PT, and I was like, Okay, well, it's my elbow that hurts. Just like FYI, it's like it's yeah. like it's Did my elbow. Right? Like yeah. it's my elbow. Like you want me to breathe on all fours? I'll be damned if immediately after I've never had the pain again. <laughs> I do it periodically just for the hell of it. If I start to feel like anything getting weird up in here, I just do the all fours belly breathing. 
Um, it stretches some things that don't get stretched very often. Um, so we'll send it to you and you, I mean, what the hell? It takes Nothing like, it takes like three minutes. You might as well try it. <laughs> I cannot guarantee that it's going to work, but for some reason it worked immediately for me. And I didn't have any belief in it either. I thought he was, I actually thought he was crazy. I was like, well, I might as well just try it before I go to the PT and I'll be damned if it didn't work. I really wasn't expecting it. All right. All right next one. Move past yeah. this. Okay. This is an extreme example of, um, once again, these are all very extreme examples <laughs> of, <laughs> I left that in there for y'all. <laughs> perfect. Yes. Um, this is the bar moving away from you for deadlift. So this could be what's happening. Not that one in particular. That one, I started with it too far away. But this could be partially what's happening that's causing your low back issue. I don't know if you video your lifts, but and it could be way less extreme too. Even just a little bit over time can add up to that low back pain. Um, so what we would suggest is like practicing proper wedging. So either going slower with your wedge or um, trying an alternate deadlift. So if your regular stance is conventional, trying a frog stance sumo for a little while and then just to mentally do something slightly different. Um, uh, you can also work on your lat strength. If it's lat based, maybe lat based, it may be because you're not able to like lock your lats down properly and they get loose and that's what causes the swinging. Most likely that's not the case. Most likely the case is the wedging isn't happening correctly. Mm -hmm. um, you could also work on quads if it is a, if it's stirring sumo that this is happening, you could work on quad strength. Um, but a good technical thing to practice to work on the wedging properly is low pauses. You don't have to do those during mm -hmm. your regular um, deadlifts, like during your sets. You can do them during warm ups. So practicing a low pause will help you find that wedging tipping point where that needs to be because when you wedge into place, the bar should go ahead and pop up yeah. off the ground. That's to let you know that the wedge is and right. This would be a different pause deadlift than say, if someone is programming you pause deadlifts for you to get stronger off the floor, it may not be the same spot to develop your wedge in the most efficient way right. because your pause point your most difficult part of the lift, especially in conventional, might be like mid shin yeah, or just above, like higher. just below the knee. But the to really get a nice, efficient wedge, you want to pause it just like as the bar comes that off the ground. Much so off that's the floor. that's why you've seen like if you're on Instagram and you see like every I think it was about a year and a half ago, everyone was like was a big thing. It was like this, like yeah, almost like this. Um, <laughs> It was memefied of how low can you pause your deadlifts, yeah. and can you that's really what there? that's for. Some of it is like that's developing strength for people that that lift, and that's their weakest point is right off the floor. But regardless, if you're trying to develop an efficient wedge, that really low pause is the way to go because if you're kicking that bar out even a little bit, especially on the setup, if you have a really quick wedge, mm -hmm. we see this I think more with conventional pullers than sumo slightly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that they really, you know, wedge their hips in aggressively and inevitably that bar gets kicked out even a little bit. And when you're at the top end, a half inch means, could mean a failed lift versus a good lift. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's true. So working on your low pauses or working on your efficiency of your technique. And that's something to do during your warm up sets too. Or during, if you have a secondary deadlift day, that's something to work on during your secondary where it's super light. Okay, I, I think I can't do this. <laughs> no, it's yeah, for whatever reason, it doesn't want to cooperate. I think we might have one more, maybe, maybe, yeah. Come on. Okay, and then obviously there's a possibility of your low back actually rounding during deadlifts, which we know is not good. What I will suggest is, what I will say is that upper back rounding during deadlifts is not bad unless it causes your wedge to not be good. So mm -hmm. sometimes you'll have an upper back rounder where that means that they have, they have some glute weakness, so they can't get their glutes down low. They can't get the wedge low enough. So what they'll do is they'll round the they'll back. They'll bend down more. Yeah, exactly, in order mm -hmm. to bend down further and because they just don't have the efficiency or the strength in the hips. So if you are a chronic upper back rounder, chances are you probably need to work on your glutes. Um, but and yeah. also develop that upper back musculature to yes, upper back musculature give your back support too. to do that. To yep. Not round as much. But yeah, I mean, obviously these are good hip strength these things. Um, yeah, that was it for that one. We're getting into, come on. 
Why are you doing I think that? it wants to play the video. Okay. And then it's okay to progress beyond it. <clears throat> oh, that's stupid. I'm glad I didn't hurt myself doing these shitty videos. <laughs> I was really worried about it. <laughs> Okay. I did them in like these high tennis shoes too. It was really dumb. <laughs> I, I, I spent like far too long looking through athletes' videos trying to find them doing shitty things, and I was like, it's been so long since they've been doing shitty lifts. Like, I'm having to scroll back far too far. You're why an influencer I just, now. Why don't I just record them? <laughs> oh, this is a good part. All right. Yeah. yeah, you recover from this a better. Yes, and it depends on where you are in your in all of your cycles. Uh, when we first start athletes out. Um, since we don't know anything about them necessarily, we'll start them out with accessories in like the RP six to seven range, depending on the exercise. And that's just to start to get to know them. They're also just getting into a new block, new stimulus, so they're gonna have soreness and there's no point in pushing them super hard at the beginning. They're just gonna be more sore and not do as well then as the weeks progress. So we start them out a little lower, but the more blocks we get going and also the longer they've been going on a group of exercises um, across mesocycles, then we will start, usually week one is lighter, but with accessories, the RP can be seven, eight is the starting point instead of six, seven. Um, some, some accessories. Yeah, some yeah. accessories. Yeah, some accessories. Okay, <clears throat> so this is just a sort of an example block. Um, again, built around powerlifting, four days a week, and a four week cycle. So it's a scale up, we're starting light, RP fives for squats and deadlifts, RP six for comp bench, and then it progresses up till we get max RP eight on squats and deadlifts and RP nine on bench uh, for um, top triples. Just like generally you can push um, bench a little bit harder than you can push the other ones, mm -hmm. unless you're benching like 400, you know. Yeah. Even still, you just recover from it a lot faster. Yeah, but this isn't like a special case block for anyone. This is sort of a good middle Still. of the bell curve, um, somebody that's reasonably strong and doesn't really have any issues. So yeah. Do they have copies of this? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. I think it's I'm, out. I'm not sure I'm if like, it's large enough to see, but. Oh, maybe yeah. anybody yeah. with this look tiny doesn't. There's it. an example balanced exercise. Oh yeah. yeah. There may not yeah. be. A... It's, I think the block is the same, but. Yeah. We can yeah. send it if, if this would be helpful to anybody. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's, okay, so you've gone over the healthy block. Yes, um, yeah, that's the healthy so block. So what kind of injury do we have? Like, what are we, what are we working around? Trap pain after benching. Trap pain. Day after benching. Day okay. after benching. Like okay. very tight. And okay, and um, so what, what sorts of things, like can't you do then, or are very difficult to do? Limited range of motion. Um, also just kind of feels very tight almost like headache symptoms, mm -hmm. okay. um, but uh, yeah, it's, so it's actually uh, usually if, if you really, really like massage it, the cross ball will dig in there. I was about like to that, say. Um, you can get yeah. it moving again. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. but, okay. yeah. but benching is out the next day? Um, yeah, this is something that happens the day after benching and sometimes does not clear up before the next chest movement mm -hmm. day. And how are rows, pulls? Oh. That pull down spine. Yeah, yeah, oh. holding doesn't hurt. Interesting. Oh. Deadlift spine. Uh, sometimes slightly aggravating because of pulls that traps into more lengthened position, mm -hmm. but um, okay. not as bad. Okay. So any pushes are the problem then the next day. What about okay. like shoulder pressing? Shoulder pressing, mm -hmm. no good. Um, you mean like an overhead shoulder? Yeah, press. like a dumbbell shoulder press. Yeah, that would be an aggravating movement. Okay. Uh, climb bench, aggravating. Okay. 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 All right. Let's work through it. All right. So then in this But block, it's fine with squats? Uh, yeah, I can usually get into position with squats, although you do feel the tightness. Uh -huh. Like if I work on loosening it up, yeah. it usually does not prevent me from hitting what I wanted to do with squats that day. Okay. Okay. So obviously we would look at the movement pattern and see what we can change about it if this is a recurring issue. But let's say this is not a recurring issue and it just happens. <laughs> this is how we would change the program. Yeah, if it's not a recurring issue and if it clears up within, like, if it only affects you for one lifting day, that's probably not something that we're going to do, like, a block change for. Mm -hmm. Or probably... may change the week. If, yeah. Y yeah. Or just <clears throat> cut out comp bench for that week. Or you may, if it's, if it's comp bench that does this, 
we may move comp bench to the end of the week mm -hmm. or a point where you have two rest days after it mm -hmm. to let that clear up before you start again. We mm -hmm. would probably arrange um, the day that it happens in the block to just circumvent that so you can continue on. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's something that affects you to the point where now the entire downstream of days one through four every single week are affected, that's where we would actually just change the exercise. Yeah. It sounds like the exercise would be the, the, the problem. Yeah, the offender might be the exercise. Yeah. So we'd look at the movement <clears throat> pattern and see what is happening here because it might be you have a little too much flare, which is causing a little too much trap situation going on. Um, you may want to switch the whole block to a Swiss bar bench if that's not offending. Mm -hmm. Have you tried a Swiss bar bench? Is this a problem that's real? It's a real problem. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, it's a real <laughs> Yeah, so I would say like flat dumbbell benching in a more um, scaption kind of uh, position is okay. pretty comfortable. Okay. It doesn't aggravate it as badly as barbell bench or mm. uh, incline bench does. Okay. And are you really like trying to retract with your bench like I've, a lot? I have tried varying degrees of like how much I focus on my shoulder blades when I do so. I've tried like the traditional thing you always do, like back and down, right? You start uh -huh. back. And it's like I, I did not love that. It, it felt a little too restricted, so I tried more, yeah. more like down uh -huh. than back. And that's like okay, it's a little more natural, uh -huh. but I think maybe it's just not enough to clear up the pain. It's mm -hmm. just a little less aggravating. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. part of this is just like, okay, no, I need to like sidestep into other goals for a little while to really give this more time. But yeah. mm -hmm. if we're just talking about movements, yes, um, more more kind of like neutral grip is, is more comfortable for pressing. Yeah, okay. I would probably switch for a block um, mm -hmm. to what, yeah, I would switch for a whole block probably and make that be a Swiss bar bench. Yeah. So then if the neutral grip is fine, uh, at least then you can still be doing something on a barbell so you can load it up a little bit more and hopefully not lose as much strength. So yeah, comp bench would probably, well maybe on, on your non-main comp, but on your non-main bench day, you might want to be doing the neutral grip dumbbells instead. Uh, which day is the main bench day? Or one. Day that's one. That's one, so yeah, probably Swiss bar, I would switch it to you. you? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean I have other follow-up questions because like there's so much nuance with this is like I also want to know how do you warm up for bench? Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to know what your leg drive is like too. <laughs> I, I feel like leg drive is probably, so if I would go to movement, um, yeah, I would probably switch up. You for, During this block we would work on leg drive because probably mm -hmm. leg drive is your problem here. You're not getting sufficient leg drive to put yourself <laughs> in a good decline position. Your leg drive is probably and, insufficient. And the scapular depression part of it too isn't necessarily, you don't have to force it, you with, don't force your, it with your body. With your muscles. Try to get your leg drive to do that for you. Yes, 100% yeah. should come from the legs. I just saw this, I think it was Joe Stanek who was posting about it. He was saying like 100% of shoulder position I set with my legs. Yep, 100%. Yeah. Yep. Yep. yep, totally. Seems incredibly foreign to me. And if you're on a slippery <laughs> bench, make it not slippery. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because that's going to screw you over like right away. Yeah, you got to set up the tools to work for you. And if the gym has, we, we have one bench that one is, is slippery. awful. Yeah. And put bands on that thing. Mm -hmm. Like make it sticky. If you have to use that one, put bands on it. If yes. you don't have to use it, don't use it. Just we literally have, use um, the other ones. We have bits of drawer liner in the class space. Yep. It sticks like glue. In fact, it leaves residue on there because it's so <laughs> sticky. But you will stick to that bench. Mm -hmm. Put it under your shoulder Fine blades. Because I didn't yes. know. I, I know. Like I don't want to potentially like damage a band. Yeah, you're Use fine. We, okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll throw Do the it. bands away. It's fine. It, that's a consumable. Liner, yeah, yeah, the drawer liner just feels better, and it feels it less a lot like. Than it's like a dollar for ten feet of it. Like yeah. yeah. What I mean. so, okay. We don't care. You use the use the tools that you're just full of. Exactly. You. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you break that, a band, just throw it away. Yeah. But that leg drive, you know, plant your traps into the bench. Um, get as much retraction as you feel like you need to comfortably without you know making it a thing. But then that leg drive, really dig your feet into the floor and push yourself back and try to wrinkle your back up. Try to pull your scapula down with that leg and drive. Bring your ribs up yes. as well. But that's all from the legs. All that's coming from the legs. That'll probably clear up your trap situation. But if you don't let it like chill out in the meantime, yeah. so I would do the Swiss bar while you're letting it chill out yeah. and while you're thinking about how you're going. And you could practice it with just the barbell or just super lightweight. Practice the leg drive situation. Um, but yeah, I'd probably switch that to Swiss bar bench. I maybe would take out if, a top If none set. of that helped, then we would switch it out to Swiss bar bench. And no, yeah. But it's helping up. that you're talking about both, right? There's programming changes to stop aggravating, mm -hmm. but continue to 
make some progress through your goals exactly. while you work on the movement stuff that may have led you there in the first mm -hmm. place. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. There, there's so many there's so many movement issues that can be causing the thing. There's no way we could go over every single one mm -hmm. of them, but that's a really good one, actually, because if you're not setting your leg drive to set that, mm -hmm. you can end up with problems like that. I would maybe include a little bit of extra rear delt work, too, probably, just to give a better, like, nice base to push into yep. so that you can feel that muscle engaging back there, too. And full range of motion for that movement, too. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, with resistance. Mm -hmm. So, like, a fully, like, come out and pull back. Yeah. Out. Or I really like the ISO row machine for rear del. I've, I've had mm -hmm. excellent success Just with hitting rear del with use that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Use the high one and pull yes. like that. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. So um, that's why we're not like typing things to, in here totally because we're like we're more prone to be like that sounds like a movement thing rather mm -hmm. than uh, let's make a bunch of block changes because you might still be able to do comp bench yep. and if we can we'd rather leave that in there because that's important to build your total. Yep. Yep. Rather than going to Swiss bar, that's such a not specific movement to a barbell bench that we'd want to try other grip. things first before we go to changing your grip entirely. And you yep, know. yep, yeah, totally. And that might solve it like pretty quick, actually. Yeah, and you said that like feet up bench isn't. Uh, does that help? Um, I haven't done like feet up or Larson in a little while. It's mm -hmm. just not. I've pared yeah. my program down for other reasons, just volume mm -hmm. more conducive to being in a deficit for a little while. But, mm -hmm. yeah. So a lot of the accessories have kind of gone on the shelf. Uh, but those I always felt like were pretty comfortable. And that's probably a sign that I'm not getting as much out of my leg drive as I should have. Because mm -hmm. um, like Larson or feet up was like, okay, this is fine. This isn't that much different. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yep. Sounds like a leg drive thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What else we got? You can make it up if you want to, yeah. or you can, it can be a real problem. <laughs> So, like, I have, like, the lower back thing after I deadlift. Be as um, specific as you can about where you feel it. How, does it. Does it radiate? Does it not radiate? Like, yeah, sure. So, like, uh, I have, like, pain in, like, like the glute med or, like, uh, piriformis area. Okay. Like, all across, like, the back side of, like, the iliac crest. Um, mm -hmm. Could be, like, even SI joints. Um, uh-huh, uh-huh. That, that pain is, uh, it becomes more immediate as I continue to aggravate it. Uh-huh. Um, is it central or one side? It's mostly right side. Okay. Um, but it can aggravate the left side as well. Um, and then throughout the, the rest of the week, I like it affects my squat. Mm -hmm. And then like my QLs like really fire up mm -hmm. when I squat. Um, so yeah, my deadlift affects my squat. And then like I can bench still, but that's pretty much it. So maybe you could do one that looks like I've been off for a couple weeks now. Mm -hmm. So maybe like coming back into it. Okay. How are you walking? Not as much as I should. I am walking though. Okay. You know, like maybe yeah. like three days out of the week, I'll like go out and hike. But okay. Good. Okay. And have you seen anybody about this? Uh, yeah, I'm seeing a PT right now. She's giving me a bunch of different stuff and just like little like necks and other areas. But um, okay. Yeah, um, mostly to strengthen like glutes and uh, I guess like stretch QLs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so they've cleared you to lift, and did they say like what restrictions you need to? No, stay with no one but my central nervous system has told me to uh, stop lifting mm -hmm. um, okay <laughs> so gotcha <laughs> I mean <laughs> having that thing in charge is really really it really <laughs> like, I just like I'm super frustrated with it like I'm you know I'm super busy with work and like yeah. I was just like I can't do this right now yeah know? yeah I yeah think, I think since I'm in the off season it, it makes sense to take a break now's yeah. the perfect time yeah to diagnose those things so I can be stronger okay yeah in season right but I'm not really lifting right now. I'm just doing my PT. Okay. okay. Well, I think we both know, like, the things we would change in this program, it's going to be kind of extensive. Yeah. But some things are going to stay the same. Yeah. Like, a lot of your upper body stuff is probably going to stay. Upper body is going to be the pretty same. much the same. Unless um, you have, like, we're in, uh, try the all fours belly breathing situation. Maybe that'll clear up your bicep right away. I don't know. Magic happens sometimes. Is, like, is, don't so question it. Is all fours belly breathing, like, the... This way. It's literally this way. like this, okay? So this is what You're it looks like. You're not going to be able like. to see. You're going to have to go over. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're basically pushing the floor away so that you get a little rounding in the upper back. Yeah. And then you just breathe. <sighs> into your belly or? Into your, deep into your belly. <sighs> and I did it like five or six breaths like that. And it literally went away. That was literally it. I know it's it really stupid. It's super dumb. 
I don't know. Try it. I tried it. Like I was warming up for bench, and I was like, oh, it's hurting again. Like it's still hurting. And uh, I he sent it. I t sent him right then. I was like, it's fine. I'm gonna go to a PT. I'm not just not gonna bench today because it's really aggravated. Like it had. It had gradually gotten worse and worse and worse, and it got to the point where I was like, I can't, like, I can't bench anymore. Like, it hurts so bad, I can't even bench. Um, and he sent me that right away, and I was about to like put all the bench stuff away, and I'm like, whatever, it's not, it's my elbow, but okay, I'm gonna try this stupid thing with my belly breathing. And it really did. It actually cleared it up right away. I don't even know what kind of magic that is. I think it's just like the way that I'm holding the barbell, and, and it could be similar for you, the way that you're hold, where you're holding it out in your hand with the extra time under tension by tempoing your bench down, just could be pulling some stuff there and really, really like causing things to lock up. Um, something that we had another athlete do the all four belly breathing and that helped him as well, um, but he added in this as well to stretch the other side. So maybe try both. So try like, Pushing. On your, the backs of your hands. Exactly, pushing on the backs. You gently pushing on the backs of your hand because it can hurt like really bad. Jeez. I can't gently. do that. Do the hands do that? They do. Yeah. Just Some like, people. don't put weight, you know, just like put a I gentle see. amount of weight so that you're stretching the other side as well. So try both of them because you, I don't know how you're gripping in order to, like, but it may be that you're holding it a little bit further back so it's causing tightness here instead of here. Um, so try both. Both sides. The grip thing you said made some sense to me too because like I, I had obviously wrist pain is the, the first thing that you started but like I, I got like one grip adjustment and haven't dealt with that pretty much ever since. Yeah I'll sometimes it sometimes it really is just a quick fix and, uh, and yeah. that's it and you move along. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but yeah, here's what we would do with okay. um, a low back situation. So we're gonna, I think, starting over. With I think a low we're going to first highlight the rows that are like suspect. Problem, yeah. Um, so you're, you said it affects your squat. It was going to say it might be the deadlift that's Only being. after the deadlift. Yeah, I can probably squat pretty consistently um, if deadlift's not there. Um, but as soon as I'm deadlifting from the floor, or even like block pulls. So like, I was block pulling for like four freaking months. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I wanted to strangle Jody. <laughs> just block pulling for it. <laughs> and then like, a couple weeks pulling from the floor, like, I'm here now. It's back like, again. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. And was there any pain with the block pulls, ever? Not really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or if there was any pain, we're talking like less than a three situation. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I wish this button was up where I could see it. But I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, all that stuff is good. Yeah. All that stuff is good. We're I would maybe to take out down. top set and squats. Just to, just going yep. back again, I would take out top set and squats. Yep. Like QLs, it is bilateral. Quadrilateral, yeah. Lumbaris, yeah, it's, it's like, one, like one of the lumbar. Um, it's like down here-ish. Like, like it's shaped like so, like a triangle, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm just going day by day, <clears throat> just picking out the things that are going to change. Could possibly exacerbate it. Um, first, you know, if this is our athlete, we're going to ask them. You know what movements uh, we will leg probably curls, already know. I might, I might let's switch those to something else. Leg curls. I leg feel curls like curls in the low back sometimes when I'm pushing really hard. Yeah. yeah do, have you tried? Do you, have you tried leg curls with this? Do you feel it? Leg curls are fine. Okay, yeah. leave leg curls yeah. in. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would. I mean, if you it's can. Just compound movements. Okay. So you did leg curls specific, yeah. but I feel like the lying leg curls would. Wouldn't that be more problematic? I would think lying leg curls would be nicer. Um, I think just, you need to just try. Yeah, try them. <laughs> the leg curls are great if yep. you can do them. Yep, get out your notebook, write your pain scale down. SSB might be a problem. It might. Um, yeah. Yep. It's just so brace heavy. Mm -hmm. um, Although, if you SSB. tried it with just the bar, if you could do SSB, it would be excellent. So try, I would, I would maybe highlight that a different <coughs> color and be like, go in, Try with just the bar. If mm -hmm. you're feeling it immediately, don't do it. There's some. Uh, there's a bunch of rotational stuff we're going to add into this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but what about belt squat? Um, belt squat, I'm okay with. Yeah. Cool. All right, day four. Um, have you tried sumo? Uh, no, I want to. Oh, okay. Yeah, sumo would be. So that's a, good, a question mark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. a question mark. That would be a good thing to try. Yep. Yeah, well, um, my leverage. It looks like, yeah. Okay, we're just gonna leave that. The blue is a question mark. Um, then we'll bench, seated row, seated is probably cable, fine. row. Seated cable row, like That's that position. 
that bent forward position is all right? Okay. Uh, and then this is just core work, honestly. I would so I would swap it for something different, mm -hmm. though. More targeted. Yeah. Orangutan flags? <laughs> Dragon. Dragon. Dragon flags. <laughs> I had not heard of those before I asked uh, in chat for core exercises. I think I got a core issue, too. You might. Yeah. Probably like tight hips. QL might, yeah, QL sometimes mm -hmm. is from a core situation. Like either your uh, your brace is not super efficient and um, it's causing a little bit of leaning, which can pull on the QL. I had an athlete with a QL thing from squats. Okay, so first of all, look at the block though. Look at all the stuff that stayed white and orange. Mm -hmm. That's all the stuff that stays the same and that's all the stuff that doesn't need to change. Yep. So like those that's are, pretty huge. yeah, that's huge. That's a lot of work. If you like add up all that tonnage, that's, that's still a lot of work you're going to do. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really easy to focus on the problem, especially when you're dealing with it in real life, like you wake up with it and you're walking around with it. So it's really easy, like, a, like you have this, like you bit your inside of your cheek and now you're always <laughs> messing with it because it's right <laughs> there. But this gives you objective proof that, okay, not a lot is that different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your deadlift is maybe not going to be worked on directly, but everything else is looking pretty decent. Mm -hmm. um, so that said, <clears throat> uh, if we're going to change anything, first of all, we're going to take out comp deadlifts and we're probably going to do, uh, I don't know, what do you think on that? I'll, I'll even take some. <laughs> yeah. I might I might want just take out the comp deadlift mm -hmm. for a little while. If he's willing to try sumo, I just take out that one. Or swap yeah. it and put sumo there if that's like the way that the block looks yeah. better. You could even have two sumo days and one could be a lighter but day. But no top set on No top sets. That. No top sets for a little straight while. Sets. Yeah. And we're gonna do RPE mm -hmm. on this. Um, you know, start out like a four, a four, yeah, really light, like stupid light, <clears throat> like really start out with a start out with like mm -hmm. one fifty five, you know. And, and people just like, shit on RPE four or five work. It's not worthless at all. No, it's this really is not. Um, it can be very fruitful. And the more you know RPE for yourself, the more accurate you're going to be with this. But if you're not so great with RPE, that's where RPE four can easily be junk volume, or it can be an overshoot, and you're just convincing yourself it's a four. So. Um, you know, this is more for people that like really know and also for a coach that really knows their lifter to say, okay, yes. what, what weight range should we, we be in here with? Like, what is an RPE for for you? But it's okay <clears throat> when you're learning a movement too. Like if you're learning sumo deadlift and you've never done it before, like starting with something that's very light, even if it's not actually a four, like you can definitely get more than six of these. Mm -hmm. um, th that's not junk either because then you're still learning technique. Um, and you're also, like we've said before, you're creating a positive lifting experience. It's like you're not creating pain, but you're lifting things, and your body remembers that, and it knows it, and it takes note. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. We might do a four for two weeks in a row. Yeah. <laughs> Just based would. on the severity of like what you're having to deal with in but your life. But it could be that you're adding 10 pounds the second week, or it could be mm -hmm. that you're doing the same weight both weeks. Yeah. If you experienced zero pain with 155 one week, I think it's perfectly fine to go to 165 or 175 the next week. And if, if you're experiencing zero pain, like you can take bigger jumps. You don't want to take massive jumps. Like I'm not talking about like adding 50 pounds all at one time, but you can take 20 pound jumps per week if you're not experiencing any pain. If you're experiencing slightly elevated pain per week, you have to be really honest with yourself. Um, it would also be really nice to have a pain scale in here by the day and like make note of at the end of the day, where's my pain at? Like, where am I at? Um, that way you can really look back at it and be like, oh, my pain is kind of like low key creeping up a little bit. <laughs> um, and that's where you'll need to like tear back a little bit and start rebuilding. Then maybe you have to rebuild a little slower. You may not have to, but if you watch the pain scale and it's going up, that's your cue that you're rebuilding a little bit too fast. And really, this is all just arbitrary sort of numbers in here, just as a what scale. What we might would put for an athlete. <clears throat> yeah. And what we'd also put in here is like um, another column. This is, I had to crop a bunch of stuff off of what our block normally looks like. Uh, we have RP rating columns where you put in what was the RP like. for you, regardless of what it was prescribed at. And uh, if you're going through anything like this, this is where you would have what was the pain like and you'd put your pain rating in that cell as well, mm -hmm. just so that we're aware where you're at um, objectively, you know, try to quantify it as much as possible. And it really helps to have that 
that sort of like pain experience journal mm -hmm. um, history so that you can look back and be like, wow, you know, I was like feeling this and I was doing like just a plate and now I'm like at three plates and like the pain is less. <clears throat> it's really good to see that mm -hmm. uh, so that you can tangibly see that process, uh, the progress. Okay, so that's just the like first three weeks basically uh would you be that that? rdls might be an offender as well so you might would want to do something um that's more low back rehab prehab situation. probably um i'd probably move to like a glute ham raise uh -huh. rdl's not so bad um because i'm not starting from the floor it mm -hmm. seems like when i'm starting from the floor conventional is the issue so okay. like dumbbell rdls or like where would rdls Oh, or you're talking about RDLs, but you have them set at a height, so you just walk it back out, and then just... I mean, I don't really or you're deadlifting it up. I don't really need to do, like, uh, I don't need to modify the RDL. Um, it's because, like, you know, it's it's almost like a block pull, like, where I'm feeling enough stretch, like, it's not... Okay, yeah, 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 anything. okay. Um, so, yeah, I can do, like, 90s, 100s, like, okay. 9 RP. Okay. And it doesn't hurt to pick them up? Um, I kind of have to do some... Mm, okay okay <laughs> okay yeah I, I would first I would probably take him out for a few weeks yeah and then start low with the mm -hmm. weight yeah I would start low with the weight because one wrong you don't want to do anything where you make one slight wrong mm -hmm. movement and then you're screwed <clears throat> because you've sent that pain signal to your head again and then you got to start over again it's not worth it it's honestly not worth it because yeah. they'll be there for you when it's a hundred percent um so I would probably yeah maybe glute ham raise or did get to the point where like, hey, I want to test RDLs. Could you do them in a rack or like? You totally could. Yeah, I was just like thinking that. I was just thinking like you could really just start with it at a higher position and just step back with it and then just like gently, you know, feel it out. Oh, that might be safer than dumbbells because dumbbells can, you know, that one wrong twist and then it's suddenly mm -hmm. like, oh, you've like redone something. And the thing about the injury is you're quick to or a pain, not even necessarily an injury, but as soon as you do something to it again, it's already guarded up. So it's quicker to send the pain signal the second time around. Um, and it's usually sharper and more like, hey, quit fucking with me, you know, like, so you really wanna give it some good positive experiences and don't give it any reason to um, send signals to you again. Yeah. Again, these are just body weight. Yeah. VW is body weight and tearing up on reps week on week. <clears throat> if you haven't done GHRs in a while, like it sometimes takes some time to do them body weight without band assistance. Um, but if you've done GHRs, like you know what the deal is. Uh, again, if you haven't done GHRs, get ready to do band assisted ones, uh, especially the taller you are, cause like the lever arms longer. <laughs> yes, so that's just long, your lot in life. Yeah. <laughs> um, but once you're able to do like eight to 10 without a band, you can grow them really fast. Like that seems to be the threshold for people. But it's, it's great hamstring work. And incidentally, if you have knee problems, GHR is one of my favorites to go to just for assistance work to do to work your hamstrings. Um, in the past, I've had knee problems where I didn't have a good balance program and I didn't have a lot of hamstring work. And doing more hamstring work seemed to alleviate the knee problems. So that's an aside. Yeah, if you sumo deadlift, you're getting a lot of quad work in and you really have to add extra hamstring work to balance it. Yeah. All right, so that's day two. We haven't touched our squat up here yet, other than we're gonna take out, take out your top, top set. sets. Mm -hmm. If there's no, if there's no, you know, nothing offensive happening there. Um, yeah, and then go to RPE. Delete that. Uh, don't delete that too. It's also possible that you could go in and um, slightly higher volume during squats mm -hmm. yeah i would Just change that to, to something seven. else in like sevens probably yeah. <clears throat> so you can get more like work in yeah and so this is going to cross over into movement um movement modification but if you have a really i can't remember what your squat is is it really fast descent yeah i'm bouncing out the whole mm -hmm. okay do you notice any like extra That's pain QL, from that maybe. no okay mm -hmm. seemed fine all right. no, Until like the back this, issue. If I'm, usually it's whenever I'm descending um, is where like, I don't know if something going on with my bracing, but like if I deadlifted on Thursday and then like 
I crawl into the gym on Monday to squat. Like, everything hurts. Like, bracing hurts. Like, the descent hurts. Mm. Um, like, in terms of, like, the back end, like, the yeah. and stuff like that. I feel, I still feel, like, fried, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have a feeling that sumo might be a magical cure for you. For a while. For a while. <laughs> I mean, you gotta get, you gotta make the movement pattern good, yeah. but um, the switch can really take the stress off your back, which is gonna let your squat shine again, and also, you know, give mm-hmm. you something to focus on that's different from well, my back keeps getting hurt during conventional deadlifts. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with conventional deadlifts. Don't get me wrong, there is nothing mm-hmm. wrong with them. And when you're healthy, you should do them. You totally should do them. They make you strong. They they can mm-hmm. make you resilient if you take it slow with them. Um, it's just they are also very taxing. And so if you are going in in an unrecovered state, you will get hurt. <laughs> I don't know how else yeah. to say it. Like if you're going in unrecovered to do conventional deadlifts, you're going to get hurt. Um, even if you're doing great form, like you can get hurt. And you mentioned your br- the brace hurts on squat day, though. Uh, from like, like in my back, like when I brace into like my, because I'm trying to do like, you know, your 360 brace yeah. and your QLs are sitting right there. So is your QLs not the piriformis region that's hurting for the bracing? When I'm squatting. Yeah, okay, after, yeah. Like after I'm, you know, jacked up from uh, deadlifting. Yeah. Uh, and that affects my strength, too. Like, I can't put as much weight on the bar. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like I'm going to crumble. Mm-hmm. Like, that's when my body starts to guard. Yeah. yeah. That's where I would say you shouldn't be squatting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're, you're just making it worse. Exactly. And you're also creating this negative experience with yes. lifting, too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just coming on bench. It sounds like your, it sounds like your deadlifts are not recoverable. It sounds yeah. like they're not recoverable. Yeah. Like no, uh, either it's the volume or it's the weight on the barbell. Yeah. They're not recoverable. Like, yeah. like when I was programming myself, I was deadlifting once every ten days. I was deadlifting maybe three times a month. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. With conventional, you don't necessarily need to deadlift more than that if your movement is efficient. Um, yeah, you don't necessarily need need to. Um, yeah, it sounds like a recovery issue to mm-hmm. me, not really a movement pattern issue. Yeah, but back to this, yeah. uh, I think in this case, we would be like, okay, if bracing and squatting is actually painful, even though it's just the brace that seems to be the problem, still we should not be putting ourselves in the position where we're doing that to ourselves. <clears throat> um, but, that, but that's only the case because of the deadlifts. So if yes. the squats are <clears throat> fine without the deadlifts, then do the squats, you know. Um, We'd have to try that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But, try it, sans deadlifts, yeah. and see if, I mean, if you're still getting the QL pain from squats, then maybe we need to back off and just do, you know, it's just really, really isolated from the deadlifts. Yeah. So yeah, but anyway, start light with the squats just to make sure that you're, you know, re- it's recoverable and that you are actually feeling excellent. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it also leaves you space to grow throughout a block too, so that you can hit a week four and like actually feel really great for your week four. Um, I almost always really like undershooting a week one and treating a week one kind of as a deload so that you've got three weeks to ramp up until your week four. So you can really like, mm-hmm. yeah, really yeah. knock it out of the park on your week four. Yeah. All right. So I've just changed these to a lower RPE, slightly higher volume, three by sevens across the board for this first block. But Sorry. your block one will not knock it out of the park on week four. Like, just no. to be clear, you will not be You're knocking anything. You're capping out an RP6 <laughs> yeah, exactly. on a set of seven <laughs> for straight it's sets. It's not the plan for a re-intro block. And just... again, this is, this is just what we're writing the block as now. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean we can't alter it week by week. Exactly. So if you're like mm-hmm. showing like, wow, I feel great, pain's going away, okay, we can attenuate that a little bit and change things and wrap, ramp things up a little bit. Mm-hmm. faster not getting any t- into anything too nothing crazy um, too crazy or aggressive yeah. but maybe not this conservative mm-hmm. but we're starting conservative because that's where we should start <clears throat> until proven otherwise <clears throat> yeah. um, b-stance rdls if those are fine have to try them because they could be piriformis like they could really irritate that region <clears throat> because of the stretch but they might not they might not it's worth a try but if you can do dumbbell b-stance rdls uh, some with no pain. Have, some people have better luck with that. That could be kind of nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't have an issue with that. It's literally just comp deadlifts. Huh. Okay. Huh. That's the only thing that's I would great. probably still, I would add some hip thrust in there somewhere, but okay, we've got gonna... other things to, yeah. Yes. Hip thrust might be a main mover for you if you don't feel the pain during the hip thrust. And if you do feel the pain during the hip thrust, you have to start slow. Only deadlifts. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
don't feel pain with hip thrusts. Well, I mean, other than like you're gonna die because they're hip thrusts. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing extra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, I was wondering where those needed to go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, hockey deadlifts. I'm putting these in here on your day two. After your sumo, we're gonna experiment with sumo. Uh, higher volume, low intensity, um, for movement pattern. Get you moving in the pattern. But also, we're going to add in hockey deadlifts. This is one of these like rotational exercises that we love to prescribe, not just to help with pain, but even if you're not experiencing pain, this is a good sort of apple a day situation um, because it's something light that you can do that um, really gets you moving uh, asymmetrically, but in a healthy way. You want to show what hockey yeah, deadlifts are? Yes, I'll show are. you what a hockey deadlift is. You want to start out with like 3 by 12 mm -hmm. at like a five to six or something like that. And you, you'll use this, um, you use a kettlebell with this. I don't have a kettlebell to use, so I'll use my, my water bottle that looks kind of like a, a weird long kettlebell. But you're gonna stand like this. You're gonna start the kettlebell out at your heel, but just outside of your heel. And then you're gonna bend down, you're gonna pick it up like this. You're gonna flex your butt at the top, and then you're gonna set it down at your heel on the other side. And it's okay if you're rounding your back somewhat with this. You don't have to brace with this. You can breathe along with this. But if you start out with, say, just a like a um, like a 35-pound kettlebell, or whatever's not offending, whatever's like a 35 pain, if that causes pain signals, just go to a lighter one. That's it. And you'd be shocked at the things this movement hits. Uh, if you've never done them before, do a set of 12, three sets of 12. Uh, you're going to feel it in a lot of different places. Weird, like weirdly hip. Also like high, um, high adductor, mm -hmm. lots of hip work. You're going to feel it in your glutes quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And we started after we had our own back issues a long time ago and uh, had to do a bunch of research for that. We, f I forget where we found this exercise. Uh, it might have been Squat University or somebody similar Probably. to that, yeah. but um, started doing them and it's, maybe it's just anecdotal, maybe it's placebo effect, but it seems to work quite well. We've given it to all of our athletes with low back issues too, and it's just a great rehab, prehab exercise. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll even just throw it in for prehab, like if things are starting to get dicey or we know that they're about to go into heavier stuff, like here's some prehab. Things might get weird. Yes. Yeah. I, I went ahead and added it. And then adding Great. two reps per week or something like mm -hmm. that is a, progressing on reps instead of weight for a little while. Yes. All right. Everything else can stay the same there. And then we get down to day three. SSB, SSB will be a try it. Um, see if you can do it. It's top excellent sets. because that'll help your QL situation. No top sets, though. Uh, no top sets, no. And I think a three by five it is fine, with, you know, ascending. Like sure. These. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, SSB would be fabulous if you could do it, but it might mm -hmm. be it might be that it, it's a little too foldy when it gets heavier, um, or it might be just fine. Um, but regardless, it's going to be really helpful in teaching the brace um, so that you are bracing properly, and then that doesn't cause any QL problems with the squat later on. Um, should you, you know, return to conventional deadlifts and all that that entails. All right, there we go. And then, yeah, you know, we moved our sumo up to our day two. Uh -huh. So this might be the hip thrust day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that can be our main mover here. And then, like, hip thrust is a main movement. Yes. No top singles for <laughs> hip thrust. <laughs> no <though>. top singles. <laughs> <laughs> What would that even look like? I have an athlete who likes to do a top single on hip thrust. <laughs> she doesn't make I don't program decisions. them. She just <laughs> likes to do them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not saying that's a good decision. It's not a good decision. And also not 3 by 5 No. Mm, something like 3 by 12 yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Starting light and really High focusing volume. on the form. Yep. Mm -hmm. Start out with 5. Mm -hmm. If there's no pain, you know, yeah. you just do a, a kind of a standard-ish Continue progressing, adding, you know, 10 to 20 pounds per week, assuming no pain. Um, sometimes hip thrust can cause a little bit of low back issues, mm -hmm. and in which case, um, go slower. Or you could try it with just, you could try glute bridge instead, which might have less low back pain involved. Um, 
Yeah, another rotational. Yes. Assuming that that's cool. I feel like that's a, this if is everything's a try chill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah if, this is a try it. Situation. If your back has chilled out and really the <laughs> offending movement has been taken out, you're probably good to do glute ham halos, which is another like a rotational exercise on the glute ham machine. So you're doing like so with a plate and then back the other way around. Mm -hmm. So you're hitting the core 360. Um, yes. Basically, you're, you're face up on the GHR machine. Like you're doing a, a sit-up on the yeah. glute ham raise. Mm -hmm. Only instead of doing the sit-up, you're holding a plate or just holding yes. your body like so yeah. and going Start around and then going around the other way. Yeah, but that would be one thing to try. If that's an offender and if that's it could painful, be. then we'll try another Do core. Do something else. More mm -hmm. of just a, a straight core exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's, um, that's basically it for that. Um, so, <clears throat> There are the things we've changed. We're still hitting a lot of the main movements in some form. Mm -hmm. The weight may not be where you would prefer it to be, <laughs> but um, you're able to move. And it's also partially a fact-finding mission to see, okay, well, what if sumo is really great? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think maintaining some curiosity about it mm -hmm. is going to be really, really important. Yeah, you might learn a lot about your lifts in that mm -hmm. sense uh, so that not only would you get good at sumo, and um, you might also get much better at your conventional deadlift mm -hmm. because you can really pick it apart. Yeah, it doesn't mean that you have to like fully give up on conventional too. It just means that you're taking it, like as you were saying, you're just taking a little detour on your path. Yes. Um, and you might learn a lot from it. And worst case scenario, you get better at sumo and you have something else in your toolbox should anything happen later on with conventional. And it, it's important, I think, to recognize that it might not. That might literally be it and you might be able to move forward with no more low back pain because that has been the case for me. I have not revisited low back pain. I had a very terrible time. Well, first I was doing CrossFit and I was doing AMRAP conventional deadlifts with like, what the hell? I don't know, it's CrossFit. And I, um, I ruptured, I actually ruptured a disc. So I don't have a disc in uh, between two of my vertebrae any longer. Um, that was obviously a sharp and stabby pain, but it's CrossFit, so I'm like, everyone's kind of like egging you on to continue what you're doing right so i kept lifting like an idiot and then i would get like shooting sciatica pains so i had to get some pain inject like some actual shots into that not corticosteroids but like actual something else i don't even remember what it was but um and then after that i decided that maybe crossfit's not for me so i switched to powerlifting after that but i did experience another back it back pain issue is like I was doing a uh, mixed grip sumo deadlift and kicked it out on me which is one of the things that I was saying like don't do right like don't if you're gonna mix grip it like make sure it's right up against your shins and go up very gently with it don't like whack it out in front of you um I had a the in the similar pain uh that similar region like piriformis I thought it was a piriformis thing at that first I thought it was SI because it's like very central right there and then I thought well okay well maybe it's like migrating into the like piriformis region and I couldn't really it was like very amorphous um I did not have imaging done that time um I just had I just went in for PT and they told me like hey don't lift for a little while it, this is when I realized you need to really find a PT who's very supportive of your lifting and not one who's like well maybe you should just try something else maybe you want to take up swimming now I'm like no I'm not gonna take up swim I'll maybe I'll do swimming as well but like I don't want to give up on lifting I think it's it has other important things um but since that and since going since doing all this research and rehabbing it um myself um I have not experienced it any longer so um I think I've just been doing more recoverable work for me conventional deadlift was it was similar to yours it was just not recoverable for me I was just going in every time feeling beat up by conventional deadlifts and that's when I decided to switch to sumo which is far more recoverable for me maybe not for everyone but for me sumo was just way more recoverable um and since then I haven't had any problems um I throw in conventional every once in a while and then I remember that I hate it and so I don't do it anymore but it's good it's excellent for you and I do program it for you know, sumo athletes. I make them do conventional as well, as long as they're cool with it. Um, but yeah, all that to say, it doesn't necessarily mean you got a bad back. And making sure that you keep that out of your mind, uh, like, man, I just got, you know, I just got a shit back, you know. <laughs> Detaching it from who you are as a person is really important in moving forward. And keeping your, uh, your expectations reasonable in that this could show back up. 
Um, you know, and uh, each time that it shows up, it may be somewhat recurring, but typically what happens is each time it shows up, it's less every time. Um, when you're being smart about rehabbing it. When you're it, being yeah. smart about it, because mm -hmm. you learn what your body, how your body responds to things, you learn what your pain response is, you learn like what things trigger it, mm -hmm. and then also your mindset is just better each time that it happens, and so if your mindset's better, you tend to heal a lot faster. Yeah. It, well, yeah, if it's happening on a, you know, if it's happening occasionally, you, you've you already dealt with it before, so you know how to deal with it, so you don't freak out as much. Mm -hmm. You already have a plan in place. You're like, okay, well, all right, I won't do this this week, and I'll swap to this, and within a couple weeks, you're back to 100%, and you're able to just sort of pass by it, because chances are you're not actually having any tissue damage with the reoccurrence. It's just the pain signal is still there for any time you do that thing that's slightly off, it wants to send that pain signal because your brain is trying to keep you alive. Like that's what it's trying to do. And it's just doing its job, right? Like it just doesn't want you to die. So um, yeah, it, the pain signal does not necessarily indicate the tissue yeah. damage. But if still, you're worried about it, obviously still let go pain ahead. be your guide. But yes, if you're yeah. worried, go have it checked out. Like you, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll probably have a, an idea of if you've actually torn something or, you know, if you've torn something, you'll be bruising, like you'll have bruising. Um, All right, yeah. so are there any, um, any burning questions on this? Program changes. Program changes for any other things? Okay, because we can probably move on to the, yeah. the yeah. last bit. I mean, <clears throat> it's possible that your feelings on your RPE are more correct than the subjective look of RPE. So you could be being told to do more because it looks like you should be able to do more, but you know what I'm saying? You might be overshooting without meaning to overshoot basically. And you might just need to like cut back to make it recoverable. But a little foray into sumo in the meantime would not be harmful. Yeah, uh, I think the other thing is like percentage of like the max um, when compared to like other athletes. Yeah, I mean, it I might be. be. I should be in some like close by in some standard plot, right? But it's just you may not be. It's the word should. That's the yes, problem. exactly. You you really might not need to be there. You might need to be working extremely submaximal, and like mm -hmm. that can still get you stronger if you're working on technique. Like you don't mm -hmm. always need the heavy stimulus for conventional deadlifts in order everybody. to get stronger. No, it absolutely doesn't. Yeah. Uh, we find that particularly the case with, um, not, not that you are, but with master's athletes, like you don't necessarily need, <laughs> you're not, you're not, but they don't necessarily need and as males frequent. overall. Like, yeah, males. Especially mm -hmm. the bigger, the bigger the male, yeah. um, bigger the lifter, you know, you just you're just don't. objectively living, he lifting heavier anyway, mm -hmm. um, and the stronger you are, uh, that's going to be harder to recover from, so, yeah. Yep. Yep. Those RPE5s aren't, aren't for nothing for everybody. Yeah. But if you're like a lighter weight female and younger, then you know maybe that's not the case. Maybe you, you will more need a heavier more stimulus mm -hmm. more often to make strength gains. Yeah, it's very it's very lifter dependent, and people might you know like egg you on. It's like man, you really like sandbag your lifts. <laughs> you might you be like yeah, well I kind of need to sandbag my lifts so I don't get hurt. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of can get a bad rap sometime from from. You know, just gonna, around. This is exactly what we're going to talk about now. This is the next part of the. Oh, great! This yeah, is the last part of the presentation. This is it. This is the end of it. The yes. decreasing injury risk bit. Like I really like to work hard. I like to work too hard. Mm -hmm. it like it generally feels good, but you can't make progress if you're working hard all the time. Because you can't recover. If you can't recover, then I'd argue yeah. you can still work just as hard on RP five as you can on a. RP9. You can, it's just a different kind of work. It is. It's a different kind of work. And that may not be the kind of work that you... Yeah, you, you can. You just can the intent, the focus. Literally the paying attention to everything that you're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, warming up. Okay. Decreasing injury risk. Yes, decreasing injury risk. Uh, so we wanted to put this in here because it's really important for just like avoiding pain to begin with. And uh, it would suck if we didn't say the things that we've learned that help with that so one thing just really quick like pre-movement when you're going into the gym yes like foam rolling is great but we have like preferred things that you would we'd rather you do including walking if you bike here that's awesome 
um, regular active movement, like actually moving around, moving your body around, not just laying on the floor and like rolling your muscles out with a foam roller. If foam rolling works for you, if that makes you feel more confident in your list, makes you feel bodily just better, then do that too. That's fine. But we'd prefer that you actually have like full range of motion stuff that you do before you actually get with a barbell. <coughs> and um, one thing to think about is like, how many warm ups are you doing for your main lifts, especially? So when you walk in there and you're doing, uh, getting ready to do a squat workout, do you have your warm ups planned? Uh, generally, you'll have, if you're doing top sets, you're going to have a top set in mind or a range that you're going to do in mind. And what warm ups are you going to do to get there? And a general rule of thumb, if you haven't really done any movements in the gym yet, other than your like stationary bike or you've walked here or whatever, five to six warm-up sets. And again, we're talking about the middle of that bell curve for most people, five to six warm-up sets is a great rule of thumb to operate with. You wanna structure those smartly though. If you're gonna work up to a, a top set of five that's relatively high RPE, you don't wanna do sets of five for all of your warm-ups. Um, so think about that. And then for your accessories, the more warm you are, the fewer warm up sets you're going to need. So if you're gonna go do dumbbell bench after you've just done barbell bench press, do you need a ton of warm ups? No. Might you need one or two warm ups? Maybe. I do. I, I love to take a couple of sets with sm smaller dumbbell weights before I hit my top dumbbell set weights. I've had shoulder issues in the past, and for me, it's just non negotiable. I don't want to do that again because that was a long time that I had to shoulder deal with that. Shoulder is like yes. shit. It was like eight months. Try to not get your shoulders injured if you can because that shit takes forever. It does. It just takes forever. <laughs> Other things can heal a lot faster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I take warm up sets with my dumbbell bench even after I bench pressed. Uh, not a ton. I don't do five to six warm ups. I just like do one or two sets. That said, once you're ready to go, this is just an example for squats. And you may have something that works, that's great. We're just gonna put that out, this out there in case this helps somebody. Uh, this is actually an example from um, something that I did the other week where I had a top set of four planned at 170 kilos. Sorry, it's not in pounds. We just left it in kilos. Uh, it's you like do 375, math. right? Whatever, yeah. it is what it is. It doesn't really yeah. matter, like the relative numbers matter more than the actual number. Uh, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm just saying that I'm not weak, okay? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I had a top set of four plan at 170 kilos. Uh, I knew that I wanted to take a 20 kilo jump from my last warm up to that. Uh, I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, so I knew my last warm up was gonna be 150 kilos. So I start with the bar, do a few reps, throw a red on each side, 70 kilos, do a set of five, and then I threw two reds on, 120 kilos, do a set of three. Very intentional, I'm treating these just like I would my top set. Everything is very focused. I'm, uh, and then I do one last warm-up set at 150 kilos, but I only do a single. So I spent a couple sets at 120 kilos to say, I just wanna save fatigue. I don't wanna warm up so close to my top set that I'm actually racking up fatigue and sort of like withdrawing the amount of strength that I have in the bank too soon. I wanna save it for my top set so I can perform at my best so that that set moves the greatest that it can. <clears throat> so I'm, sitting, I'm spending more time in that like mid warm-up range. Then when I get to my last warm-up, I'm only going to do a single for the same reason. I don't want to do a bunch of reps with it. I just want to get acclimated to the weight. I want to move it once to feel it and to continue to warm up, but only do it enough to be warmed up. I don't want to do too much. Then I execute my top set. So, um, so that's the reasoning for that. There's a couple other warm-up schemes for bench press and deadlifts in here. Um, you can look at those and um, it's the same principle. But, um, let's see, the things we were going to say about this, was this after we were going to, I'm trying to remember the, um, yeah, it's after is when we, yeah, yeah. when we, our when anecdote, we, yeah, yes, it's okay, yeah, after. when we get to the graphs, <laughs> yes, okay, I yes, I was like graphs, yes, yeah, okay, so we'll explain a little you bit more about why, you can look at these yourself yeah. about, but it's, it runs a similar idea, yeah, but we'll explain a little bit more about like why are, why are we like emphasizing warm up sets with this, mm -hmm. and we Especially have a couple of final warm up, yeah, final warm up. We have a couple of anecdotes. Uh, each of us have have an athlete that, um, and we each have done this that this is relevant for. Yes. Okay, so along that decreasing risk, uh, fatigue management, does your program allow for proper recovery? And this is where we're going to look at the int relative intensities across weeks where you can see, okay, how hard am I working and what that might that do? 
and if uh, your program really should be undulating your intensity over time to make sure that you're able to recover. So, um, <clears throat> so not just so you can recover, but you want to make sure that you can execute when you really need to execute. And if you're overly fatigued, you're just more prone to mistakes. Uh, that's you know just a given. Mm -hmm. So if you're overly fatigued, you're not going to perform well in the day. Things fall apart, and when things fall apart, that's usually when you get hurt. Okay. <clears throat> So with this, the top graphs, they're very similar ways to program, but they're going to have very different, uh, it's going to look very different in terms of what weight is on the bar. The top left is programmed straight percentages. This is top triples for squat only. We're not looking at any other list. We're just looking at a squat and we're looking at week by week what that top set looks like for a triple. <clears throat> so week one, programmed at 68% for the top triple, week two, 77%, week three, 83%, week four, 89%. And then on week five or week one of the next block, in other words, we're going to go back down, but we're not going to go back down to where we were. We're going to tear it up just a little bit. So we're only adding 2% week one to week one of the next block. And so you get this sawtooth pattern with progression. So if you continue this out over three, six, nine blocks, hopefully that trend line is going to go up at a very gradual rate, but not at the same like individual slope that each block has. It's going to be much more gradual. Mm -hmm. This gives you time to recover and it builds your conditioning starting from week one as opposed to this last thing down here. If your RPE eights all the time, there's no way for your body to develop the conditioning to do this unless you have like extra help or something like that. Um, like steroids? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and, and, you know, extreme youth. Yes. <laughs> or the combination of the two. One or you know. the other or both. Yes, extreme um, youth. But even, but even said, I mean, you know, look at, look at a lot of enhanced lifters. Like they don't stay in the spotlight for very long because they burn themselves they burn out, out pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, could you do the RPE8s all the time? Possibly, but can you do that for a long time and lift your whole life? I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I know of many examples no, that do. Which is why we get back to, we want to do this yes. forever. And we want all of our people to be able yeah. to do this forever for the other health benefits. Yeah. And we want to get the things that we, uh, the reasons that we love this sport and that we got into this sport, like we want to maintain those things and we want to feel those things forever. So um, we're going to try to mitigate the, the bad parts as much as we can. So that said, with straight percentages, programming straight percentages is kind of okay when you're trying to like learn a lifter and they're not like super experienced with RPE, for example, uh, rate of perceived exertion. But once you start to know your lifters a little bit more and once you yourself know yourself as a lifter more, you know sort of what your level of effort actually is. So you can rate yourself on RPE more accurately the more you do this and the more you practice uh, looking at it and self evaluating what your RPE is. So and video I mean, your lifts. Yeah, for that specifically for evaluating RPE, I like to use a three pronged approach. I subjectively rate it after the lift, what did I think the exertion level was. Then I watch the video and I look at what did I think the exertion level was. And then I ask someone else, either a training partner or the internets. And I generally- Training among, partner is preferred. A training partner is highly They know preferred. your lifts more. Yeah, exactly. They know like what you're capable of, what your grind mm -hmm. is capable of, that sort of thing. Um, but if you don't have a training partner, literally put it out there and people will, you know, they'll come back within a range. And among those three things, you can generally find the truth. And that's really to help teach you how to rate RPE yourself. Yeah. And so the top right graph where you have RPE prescriptions, RPE 5, 6, 7, 8, as you go weeks 1, 2, 3, 4, and then going back down to 5, 6, 7, 8. The weights on these RPE 5s are not necessarily going to be the same. <clears throat> In theory, you're getting stronger block by block, so you're going to add a little bit to those every single time. Your baseline's a little bit higher each time, which is why it looks like that. Yeah. That said, the weights on the day, they can range. So like week three, they're at an RPE of seven. If you feel like a god that day, that weight's going to be higher than if you've lost three sleep for the last three nights and you didn't eat breakfast and you're dealing with a lot of life stress, any of those things that can tank a lift and that can be way, way, way lower. <clears throat> so that's the beauty of RPE is that you can take what's there on the day based on how it moves. Um, what this misses out on is 
um, if you have a lot of variability in your real life situation or if training hasn't been going that consistently then this can start to go off the rails a little bit because it's really easy to overshoot uh, it's really easy to misjudge an rpe and it's really hard to predict what you're able to lift the next session if you're not as consistent in everything that's been going on so um, while it's a little bit better than percentages uh, in my opinion it still helps to have somewhat of a range in mind for that mm -hmm. and so this is an example of weight ranges that are also prescribed with an RPE and so this is a, a program where you would see uh, like a, like we were typing in with the block uh, modifications for um, for Errol, where we would put an RPE, but below that we'd put in parentheses, this is the range. And this comes from knowing either yourself, if you self-program, knowing yourself very well, or it comes from knowing your athlete very well. This is something that we would do after maybe three or four blocks with the person that we would know, okay, we know what you're capable of, we know approximately what your, your maxes are, what your, your total is, and then we can say, okay, <clears throat> since we've been going consistently now, we're gonna prescribe week one is uh, in this case, it's RPE 5, RPE 6, 7, and 8, but we know the ranges at which we want to stay within for that. So let's keep that week 3 example from the last slide. In this case, it's 314 pounds, this is in pounds now, uh, to 325 pounds, um, but at an RPE of 7. And so this, this is where communication with the athletes is really important, and this is where our anecdote is going to come in. Preferably, they're gonna go in, they're gonna be like, okay, my RPE is seven, and this is my range. My last warm up felt like shit. So, should, so basically, you should put your last warm up within striking distance of both of those. Yes. Within but good striking distance I'll, of both. I'll get that in just a second, but okay. what I'm saying is if the last warm up felt like shit, should you be taking that high end of the range? No. No. Take the low end of the range. That said, if you feel like a god that day and everything's perfect and you feel unstoppable, and your last warm up is like an empty bar, do you go above 325? No. Still cap it. Still cap it. Mm -hmm, Still mm -hmm. cap it. Take the undershoot. Yeah. Because that means what On that weeks means, one, two, and three, that is, take the yes. undershoot. That means that week four is going to be really stellar. Exactly. Probably. So let that happen. Mm -hmm. Don't um, hold back. Don't go to 335 or whatever, <laughs> 345 or something like that on week three, even though it's gonna, you think it's going to move at a seven and risk the overshoot. Don't do it. Take the undershoot every single time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then just mark it down. Like yes. Mark it in your program. Like, man, today was a great day. I really undershot my top set. What you're doing is you're setting yourself up for a really stellar fourth week. Yes. So here's where our anecdotes come in, is that in the last warm-up situation really matters because if you're taking your last warm-up at 300 pounds or 305 pounds in this case, you're basically doing a top set before you do your top set. So you're racking up fatigue before you want to rack up fatigue. You want to perform at your best, but you've already taken some out of the bank that you now don't have to spend on that top set. And you really don't want to do that. So we've each had athletes, like I have one athlete in particular that um, this happened the other week. Uh, this person took uh, their last warm up, it was for deadlifts, and they took it at, um, actually, no, let me take that back, it was for squats. Uh, they took their last warm up like 10, like five to 10 kilos shy of what their top set was. Yeah, they only did it for a single and their top set was for a double. <clears throat> but um, when they went to their top set, not only did they, they took more than the range said, so they went higher than the range, but it moved like garbage. Um, so they had, done, they had done one top set unknowing, un, unwittingly, before they did their actual top set, and then the actual top set really just, it was way overshot. And yeah. it was week three. Yeah, I had an athlete who did something very similar. They took a, um, uh, they had overshot week two slightly. So they were going to take that again for week three, which is what I suggested that they do. But what they did is they took it. It moved better than expected. So they took a five kilo jump and tried to make that. So they were trying to take two top sets, basically. Well, the last one moved like absolute garbage. And I was like, well, you know, this is why you should probably stay in, in the program. So that because now we probably jacked up week four because week mm -hmm. three, we had an all out deadlift grind. So week four might be repeat week three, or it might even be go back down to week two again. Um, and indeed, this is <laughs> that's what happened to my athlete is that week four just turned into 
kind of a wash. Yeah. Uh, they didn't hit the range. They didn't hit the range at RPE that they were supposed to. Uh, basically, they took the low end of the range on week four. <laughs> and the, what we did learn from the process, we didn't, we didn't necessarily get what we wanted out of the progression for that block or that those two weeks. But what we did learn was that, okay, what does your warm-up scheme look like? And where can you really save on energy to make your top set move like you want it to? And so we had the discussion. We said, okay, well, let's, since this person squats is their thing, like this is their most confident lift. This is their, honestly, pound for pound, this is their strongest lift. Um, so we leveraged that because they don't, they're not, they don't get in their head with squats. <clears throat> so we said, okay, let's make sure that you're taking a 20 to 25 kilo jump from your last warm up to your top set in most cases, depending on what the rep scheme is. Um, but let's like, let that be set in stone so that you never take an extra top set again. And then lo and behold, they did that and they're like, oh, shit, I feel like much better. <laughs> like I have way more energy for my top set now. And the progression week on week goes a lot better because they just have more in the tank. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in other yeah. words, like watch the progression and p yes. make plans to, if you undershoot on week three, excellent. Good job. Yes. You banked it for week four. Mm -hmm. Or week five, if you're in a six week or five week block, depending on what, what your block schedule is like. Anywhere from three to six weeks is a normal block length. Yeah. Okay, so uh, fatigue management, I feel like we just talked about that. Yeah, this is a recap of yeah. what we just yeah. talked about. Oh, and then um, this is, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but we didn't really point out how, um, what a balanced exercise selection looks like for a block. And you saw it in the, the exercise that we did, but we didn't really call it like, what are the types of exercises that we're actually doing day on day? <clears throat> but we made this slide just to show, okay, what does a balanced program sort of look like so that you're not working one part of your body too many times a week or in too many times in succession in a week. And the top two blocks here, so the, this is day one, this is day two. We have our, um, over here on the right, we have primary lifts. So those, um, those two days, day one and two, compress the primary lifts as close together as possible. And this is somebody that wants to compete. So we wanna put primary squat, bench, and deadlift as close together as possible so that when it comes time to compete, they're more they're primed. Peaking together. Yeah, they're peaking together and they're more primed to hit it on the day that we wanna hit it. The other way you can do this is an SBD day where you have squat, bench, and deadlift all in one day. That's another way to or do it. Or if you're not interested in competing, spreading them out through the week is really good for fatigue management. Yes. It depends on your goals. But mm -hmm. this is somebody that wants to compete. Um, so compress those into those first two days, days three and day four. They're separated from day one and day two by a rest day. And comprise the secondary and tertiary lifts. But overall, we have on day one, mostly it's like a push day. So this is, you see like, you can go to r slash powerlifting. There's a million programs out there, and there's a lot of push-pull variants where you have you know push one day, pull one day. You have a back day. You have arm arm day. This is the powerlifting version of that, but we're trying to make it to where they're not doing too much of one thing too many days in a row because that's typically where extra fatigue happens. You can't recover, and then you end up getting hurt. So anyway, all of this is totally modable, yeah, though. Like, obviously, is. this is for somebody in particular with specific goals. Um, but basically, just making sure that you're hitting the front side of your body and the back side of your body, all muscle groups. Um, you can hit smaller muscle groups multiple mm -hmm. times per week is absolutely fine. Um, making sure that you balance uh, quads with hamstring mm -hmm. work is really important for knee health. Honestly, making sure that you're balancing front versus back of the body yeah. is really where it's at. Yeah. Um, if you're biasing too much front, that's where you may end up getting too many knee problems, even just tendonitis, stuff like that, can be from not working hamstrings enough. That's why we don't have squatting two days in a row. We have them separated by a different day or a rest day or both. In this case, it's both day two and um, after day two is a rest day, and then they go day three until they uh, squat again. So they're squatting on Monday, they're deadlifting on Tuesday, they're resting on Wednesday, and then Thursday they come in and they do high bar or some other secondary squat. <clears throat> but um, totally and utterly modable because my schedule is completely different. I squat three days in a row and that works just fine for me. I have a lot of hamstring and glute work though, so that's to balance out the forward knee travel movement so that I don't end up with knee pain and I don't, I don't have any knee pain. So um, yeah, it's totally modable. Yeah. yeah. So that's just yeah. a, uh, an example of how to balance a, a block. 
Okay. Um, yeah, more into fatigue management. Obviously, putting more muscle onto your frame is going to help you in all the ways. If you can put more muscle on, it shores up a lot of your weaknesses and a lot of the small muscle groups, which are um, responsible for the weak links, basically. Like, if you have a small muscle group that is not as strong as the other muscles, um, that's where your weak link is at, and that's where you're going to be likely to having injury. Um, if it's not technique-based. If it's technique-based, well, yeah, you probably need to change your technique. But putting on muscle is always a good idea. Um, and you can do that by working your accessories just as hard as your main lifts um, because that makes a huge difference. And that's just a really... It's, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's like a no brainer, right? Like if you want to get stronger, you want to put on more muscle, but to do that, um, you have to pay attention to your nutrition. I'm not going to go into any granular details with nutrition because we have Dania coming next month for a nutrition and, um, recovery seminar. So she's going to go over all the recovery modalities and like everything involved with the recovery, which involves nutrition as well. Um, and she's really great with that. Um, so just to be like very high level, one pound, I mean, one gram of protein per pound of goal body weight. So if you're trying to cut, you want to lower that protein. If you want to bulk, you want to raise that protein up. Um, get carbs around training, high glycemic index carbs around training. So you want to have like, you don't want to have your oatmeal before training. You want to have things like a melon or banana or something that's like raises your blood sugar a little bit. Um, making sure you get fats throughout the day, that's just good for recovery and for hormone regulation. If you cut your fats too much, you may find that your testosterone dips, um, or for women, estrogen, like shit gets weird and you know, it's not good. Make sure you get enough fats. Um, if you're only going to track one thing, oh, and the fats should come throughout the day. You don't want the fats to come like all right before training. You're going to feel like really sluggish and not good. Um, so lower fats before training and then filling out the rest of if the day. If you plan to fats. cut, if you don't know yourself well enough to know what you respond to, don't just cut fat. You're going to get sad. You will get really sad. <laughs> You're going to get really sad. <laughs> you will. Not you just will. because you can't eat ice cream, but because you literally <laughs> your brain tells you you're sad. <laughs> <laughs> it, it will make your testosterone yeah. go down and you will not be feeling good. Um, but if you're only going to track one thing, track protein and make sure that you get an adequate amount of protein. Um, those are the references that we referred to earlier about um, the effects of lifting while you're recovering from an injury. Um, we can send this to everybody also. Yeah, you've got paper copies too. Yeah, exactly. That was it. Yeah, yes. that was it. Okay. Yay. I'm sorry we went over, we went way by over like but a hey, lot. But it was the exercise that put yeah, us over, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But uh, hopefully everyone got some good information. Yeah. And um, yeah, if you have any questions Absolutely. at all, like we love what we do and we're happy yes. to share. We like love sharing the knowledge with everybody. And like there's no, you know, yeah. We're all about learning from everybody too. Like everyone has something to teach. So um, we just happen to have a lot of experience in the dealing with pain. Yeah. <laughs> Which is maybe not great. <laughs> but if we, can share, if we can share that with people um, and help people get through it faster, like great it will have been worth it basically yeah